ずに奪い全部二人かい目指すでは負けにたいかあの若い頃の気持ち踊り落とせたらよいのにもしよろしくねば Hello and welcome to Japanimation Station's Kyoto Vacation, an anime podcast brought to you by the folks at the Weekly Stuff Podcast. I'm Sean Chapman. And I'm Jonathan Lack. And we are here once again to kick back, relax, and talk about some anime this week on the show. We are continuing part five of our Kyoto Vacation with Kyoto Animation's Splendid Isolation. And we have a very special episode today because this is the first episode since Kanon that we are covering something I had not already seen. Um, we are talking about Tamako Market and its movie sequel, Tamako Love Story, the sort of spiritual successor to Kaon, something I was extremely excited to watch because I knew absolutely nothing about it. And I love Tamako Market to death. I think this is an amazing show and an amazing movie. Jonathan, your thoughts? Oh, okay. Uh, I didn't. I think wow. I think we'll get into it. I think it I think it's extraordinarily weird and its idiosyncrasies I often was amused by. I don't think as a TV show it comes together. I think there are three episodes that are great. The two Kigami Yoshiji episodes are A+, and I think episode three, I believe it is, uh, which is focused on the character Shiori, is also mm -hmm. great. Uh, I'll just say it right now, I think the Dara stuff doesn't work, and that is the part that I think kind of kills the show for me. But I loved the movie. Not coincidentally, the movie has no Dara in it. I think the movie is outstanding. I think it is a tremendous piece of direction. It was directed and completely storyboarded by Naoko Yamada, who obviously directed the show as well, but not that many of the individual episodes. And I think it is like a directorial tour de force of a movie. And I really liked that. I also think you could watch the movie without having seen a second of the show and you'd be completely fine. It's mm -hmm. very separate. So that is my thought. I, I'm not like, I don't think it's a bad show. I am glad I watched it. I was very much, I think in the same boat you were, Sean, where like, I loved Kaon so much and I'm so fascinated by the career of Naoko Yamada that I, I wanted to see like, okay, she and Reiko Yoshida, the writer, made this unprecedented hit with Kaon, the biggest thing Kyoto Animation has ever made. And then they kind of get the keys to the kingdom to make the first fully original TV show, like not based on anything this studio has ever done. So like, what is that going to be? And it is very idiosyncratic and personal in ways I find interesting. I also just found it didn't quite come together for me the way a lot of the other shows do. It has all the other things Kyoto Animation shows are good for, Animation, voice acting, direction. I think it's got those three great episodes. Show didn't really work for me. Movie worked for me 110%. That's my breakdown. Interesting. I, this is interesting because based on what I've read online, I didn't have as much time to do super in-depth research for this one um, because we were like, as recording this was me wrapping up the sort of end of a sort of semester type unit or quarter basically. So I didn't have as lot of time on my on the side to do some research stuff. But what I did when I was poking around, I found the general reaction to the show was it's pretty divisive where, and it's specifically around Dara that either like you really like him and his conclusion and like what that does to the show, or you find it very off putting. And so there are people who are like, like would say that the show would be great if Dara wasn't in it. And then there are other people who were more on like my side 
which is like Dennis kind of part of the special like sauce that makes the show what it is. Um, and I think the contrast also is one of the things that makes the movie really good and interesting is having what is it like once Dennis is not there and like Tomika is growing up and has to like move on to the next stage. I think that that's a valuable, the contrast there, the juxtaposition between the show and the movie are important with the way that I felt it. And I, I just want to right off the bat say about Dara, I like Dara when he is a comedy sprinkling on the side of episodes. The second half of the show, like seven through 12, most of the episodes are about Dara and his side of the world and the prince and all. And I just, it's, it did not fit the show to me. It took away, like the things I really liked about the show were not the weird fantasy intrusions from a racially nondescript Southern Island. Uh, it was the kind of daily life lived in aspect of this arcade that I think is phenomenally done. And I think the Dara kind of takeover of the show in the second half was where I, it, the show kind of lost me. Um, and it's where the movie got me back. So there you go. Yeah. And I think that that is like, again, this is like the common split, I think, on the show. Um, and so it's got kind of, and we'll get into it a little bit. It's got like a more of a cult status than q &E shows typically have, where it is very much a like, if you're into it, you're way into it. I'm way into it. And we'll get into it with the data stuff. But I love every part of the show. Like I never felt like it sort of lost its balance. It is a weird show for sure. It is an incredibly idiosyncratic show. And it was not what I was expecting. I didn't know again, anything about the show going in. The only things I knew were who the people behind it were. And it was effectively the same creative team from k -On. I knew that the main character was named Tomiko. And I knew that she <laughs> lived in a shopping district because that's basically what you get from the title. If you know what they're referring to with market there. Um, and that's all I knew. So I did not know there was going to be a talking bird. I did not know any of that. Um, and so it was a real kind of surprise to me getting into this show. But there is something about the the surreal elements of it that make it, for me, really unique. Because I've watched so many different kinds of Slice of Life shows. And there's there's something about the, like, let's just throw something that's really bizarre and incredibly cartoonish, um, which is Detta, who is the, like, full-on Looney Tunes cartoon character who's almost like pseudo Shakespearean in the way he's like written and kind of devised as a character. He's so theatrical. Um, I mean, he's a and Greek him, in, in my favorite yeah. version of Dara, he's a Greek chorus off on the side. Yeah. Commenting on things. He's not a main character. Uh, and, and it is super weird, but also you can see the logic in those moments. Yeah. And I think there's something about like the contrast of those different elements in showing that like the bizarre, in kind of fantastical world that Dada comes from of a talking bird who can also project images from his eyes for no discernible reason. Maybe he's a robot, but who knows what the fuck he is, um, is no more weird or strange or indiscernible than all the, like the quirky, bizarre bohemian people and things that happen in the shopping district. Like, I think there's something about the way in which it all just kind of rolls and meshes and melds together into this weird mix of just like humanness and emotion and love and family and community that I adored. Like I just loved this show to death. I think this might be one of my favorite things we've watched. Um, so like, I feel like I'm very much on the opposite end Interesting. Of, of you. Interesting. Yeah. I, again, I want to be clear. I don't, I wouldn't even say I disliked it. I, I think I chose the word least favorite or something. And, and mm -hmm. yeah, I, all the Kyoto Animation shows we've watched are good. This is a good show. It what didn't quite do it for me. I didn't feel that strongly about it. It Again, it, it lost me a little bit, particularly in the second half, once it kind of, Dara's plot becomes the show. But uh, I all those things you're saying you loved about it, I loved too. And I do think, like, it it's the, the world of it, of the arcade uh, that they are in, of the Usagiyama uh, shopping district, is so lived in. I'm like, is that Yamada Naoko's backstory? Is she a fucking, like, daughter of a mochi owner? Like, it's so detailed. Um, it feels like it's pulling from real life, other than the crazy bird, uh, mm -hmm. which is part of what makes it surreal and funny. But yes, it is It's a, it is a bizarre show. Let's, let's get through the history, because I don't have a huge yeah. amount of history here. Um, so just for context, we're going to talk, like, mostly focus our discussion on the show first, and then we'll go into the movie. So for the show, Tomiko Market... 
Um, it was originally announced in a commercial which aired during episode nine of Love, Chunibyo, and Other Delusions. And it was announced as, like, you know, they're positioned it as this is the first original animation project by KyoAni since Munto, which was that OVA, like, kind of two part OVA series. And then they did a TV adaptation of it. Um, and so it was the first thing since Munto. And it was also a project which celebrated the 10th anniversary of them creating their own series because it came out in 2013. In 2013, or. Uh, yeah, in 2013 and 2003 is when Full Metal Panic Fumofu came out. So it was the 10th anniversary of them kind of breaking out of their subcontractor world that they had been in for since the beginning of the existence of Kyoto Animation. The announcement also revealed that the series was being created by the same team that made Kaon, which had finished the Kaon movie in December 2011. And so Yamada Naoko is directing, Yoshida Reiko is writing, and Horiguchi Yukiko is in charge of character design and animation direction, just like on Kaon. The series aired for 12 episodes from January to March 2013. Um, and then QNE did their sort of thing that they do for all their shows. There's a whole bunch of different comic and market albums with character songs and promotional radio show, all that kind of stuff you would normally expect from a series like this. Um, they also did a couple of big live events. So they held a screening of the first episode with the cast and the director there. And then they also held a live stage event on May 18th. Um, so a bit after the show finished airing called Mochi Mochi Talk and Live Event Singing Dancing Festival, um, which that sounds like a very good time. Um, and then one thing that's an interesting twist, and I see this like sometimes I think people misunderstand Tomoko Market. I think some people think that it's an adaptation of the light novel, but it's not. The light novel came second. So they made the show and then they adapted it into a light novel, which was published by Kyo Annie's in-house publishing department, K. Esmo uh, Bunko. And that adaptation was written by Ichinose Mutsuki and was uh, supervised and edited by Yoshida Deiko. Um, Ichinose was one of the winners of the first Kyoto Animation Awards um, thing for his submission of the novel Oyashiki to Capelia, which was also published by K.S. Mabunko. So that series not never got turned into a uh, show or anything, but they did kind of pull someone who had submitted and won their contest to then do the light novel adaptation of the show. Then in terms of like sales and reception, Tomiko Market is pretty interesting because it definitely has become a cult hit. And we'll talk about some of that with the movie because it's a little bit more apparent with the movie. But the show itself was definitely on the lower end of sales. Um, the first volume sold about 3,600 copies. Um, and so that is not, you know, it's not the worst in the world, but it's also not particularly great. So it's above Nichi Joe but it's about half of what Hyoka sold on average per volume. So definitely no, we're not talking like a huge crazy hit like Kaon. We're not talking about a kind of modest hit like Hyoka. We're talking like something that's very kind of like run in the mill, you know, just like most shows that come out are going to get about 3,000 to 4,000 copies sold. So certainly in terms of the Blu-ray sales initially, Tomica Market does not sort of set the world on fire. When you talk about the movie, the movies where you see a little bit more of like, there's, I think, a bit of a turnaround there in terms of the reception of the show. Um, but the critical reception was always very interesting. So as I said, the critical reception was very much split of there are people who like became dyed in the wool fans of this show. I found multiple different blogs that were basically dedicated to just breaking down every episode of Tomica Market with like very like intricate detail, finding like different kinds of quotes and stuff. I wish I had more time to have read through some of that stuff um, in preparation for this podcast. But it's very clear to me that this show has like a super hardcore fan base, but it did not penetrate very far outside of that fan base, which is something a bit different than we've seen with KyoAni, which has tended to have within the niche of light, late night anime shows, like really, really big hits. Um, and this is sort of has a different kind of reception than a lot of the other stuff we've talked about. It, it does not surprise me that something this idiosyncratic would prompt yeah. big reactions in both directions. And yeah, I was scrolling through the some of the Japanese blog posts you had kind of linked to here in our notes, and they're definitely interesting. Yeah, because it, it's yeah, it's it's a weird show because it's also it's like. It seems like it's just a, a your kind of standard slice of life show on the tin. Like if you just look at the picture for the show or whatever, like a screenshot from it, you're going to think, oh, yeah, this is the people made KO and it's just a slice of life show. Um, and in some ways it is just a slice of life show, but in many ways it's not. And so it definitely sort of, I think, betrays expectations, maybe in this sort of similar way to Nietzsche Show, which is also just kind of a weird show to kind of sell and pitch to people. It's also, um, frankly, I think, a slightly weird fit as a late-night anime. 
if that makes uh-huh. sense. Like, I know it has, you know, generic similarities to other stuff that airs at late night, including k But, like, I think it has maybe a similar issue to Nichijo in that, in that it also, like, I could imagine kids enjoying this. Like, I could yes. imagine, I mean, it's, it's eye-catch is such a throwback to, like, a 90s, like, the Tamakoma Ghetto. Duh. That whole thing, like, there's just a lot of elements like that. There's, you know, Dara, obviously. Um, you know, this would not be inappropriate. This could air any time in terms of content. Um, and so I just, there's some of that that I wonder if Nichijou also had a little bit of trouble at first getting its audience because it just doesn't quite fit in its time slot. Yeah, it definitely is like, because it's got lots of stuff like that, like the eye catch, you've got like Tamako reading the title to yes. you, which I love also because the titles are always written like it's like a weird punk saying them. I don't know. It's like, yes. it's like there's, there's a lot of like zays at the end and stuff like that to give it like a bit of flavor. Yeah. But yes, it's definitely, you're right. It, it, it has an almost kind of kid show quality to it in places. It's very episodic, even more so than Slice of Life shows, like even more so than Kaon. It is very much like each episode is its own little self-contained plot. And it's only once you get to like the last two episodes that there's any kind of meaningful continuity between episodes. Um, And so in that way, it also doesn't necessarily fit what you would normally expect with a late night anime, which would be something more heavily serialized. Even if it's a slice of life, you typically have a bit more connection between episodes and longer plot threads that the show really does not have much of. Um, in terms of the crew, we've got, as we talked about, we've got Yamada Naoko as the director, Yoshida Deiko as series composer, and then Yukio Horiguchi as character design and chief animation director. Um, so we've got that all carrying over from Kaon. The composer is a pretty interesting person, um, Katoka Tomoko, um, who was the front person for the band Instant Citron, which was a band that was very active during the 90s. And then in the 2000s, uh, Katoka started doing music mostly for children's shows and commercials. Um, and I think you kind of like see a little bit of that kids show connection here. Um, and Tamako Market is one of the old, ha- tiny handful of anime she worked on. She only worked on a couple of anime. It's really both like music for her band and then music for like kids shows and TV and TV commercials. Um, and she did very tragically. She passed away from cancer um, a few years ago in, in 2020. Um, but she did the all the instrumental music. She also did, um, she composed the opening theme. So that is also um, kind of her style there as well. And that's In another part of, that makes this yeah. feel kind of kid-friendly. Or It's definitely using that kind of aesthetic. Like, you can tell why they yes. hired her specifically. It's got, like, you could imagine this score... I don't know, in like Blue's Clues or something too. Like the way it kind of plays with like kind of simple instrumentation and kind of playful kids' instruments and stuff. I don't know. And, and like I like that about it, I to, to be clear. Particularly I think a lot of the piano stuff is quite mm-hmm. lovely and I think it transitions into the movie pretty smoothly. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a unique element. Yeah, it's a good soundtrack. It doesn't stand out to me in the ways of like k soundtrack did, but this also show is not about music in the same way. Yeah. So it makes sense that it, yeah, I think it, it fits the style of the show and kind of the weird tone and stuff of the show in a really great way. Um, in terms of episode directors, it's a lot of our sort of like usual band of, of misfits here. So we've got Yamada Naoko, uh, who directs episode one. She does storyboards on the second episode and she does some of the storyboarding on episode 12. And then we get to the movie. She does all the storyboarding on the movie, which is crazy. Um, Kigami Yoshiji directed episode two, although again, the storyboards on that one were from Yamada, and then he did storyboards and he directed episode nine, which is in typical Kigami fashion, that's like the episode, like if you pick an episode from Tamako Market, it's fucking episode nine, that episode is incredibly good. Um, Oga Taichi returns here, he does two episodes, episode three, which is really good, you dropped that one as well, that was one that really stood out to me, episode ten. Um, Kitanohara Noriyuki did two episodes here, episode four and episode 11. Otodika, who the first time we saw her was with Tunibio, uh, she did episode five. We have Kawanami Eisaku, who did episode six. And then Ishihara Tatsuya did episode seven, um, which was co-directed with Ishidate. Episode seven is kind of an interesting one because it's got a lot of credits on it. I don't really know what happened behind the scenes, but it felt like there's some sort of budget crunch or something potentially happened there. Because Utsumi Hiroko, who notably did not direct any of these episodes. I mean, Free would have been, like, ongoing at this point, so that maybe makes sense. But she did do the storyboards for Episode 7, but Episode 7 was co-directed by Ishihara Tatsuya and Ishidate Taichi. So I don't know Almost makes me wonder if they were planning, like, Utsumi wanted to direct it, did the storyboards, was like, 
the sexy swimming boys are taking more time than I thought. And then they kind of bring in two of the heavy hitters with Ishihara and Ishidate to finish it up. That that almost yeah. seems like that what that could be. Yeah, because because you don't really like notice. It's not like that episode stands out as having lower production or anything. It's just weird when you look at the credits. Um, I suspect you're probably right about that. Um, and then Ishihara Tatsuya directed the finale episode 12, um, which again, some of the storyboards for that were also done by Yamado. And then you have Takimoto Yasuhiro comes in to do one episode. He does episode eight, which is an episode I particularly liked. Um, so again, we got our kind of normal, normal cast of, of characters here, um, especially for this like new phase of, um, QAnny where some of our older people, right? Like Taka Nodiko and stuff have moved on at this point. Um, so we're getting used to some of these new faces like Odorika coming in. Awesome. Yeah. No, good crew. And again, I, I have no complaints at any point about the direction. It is as good as ever for Kyoto animation. Absolutely. So how do you want to go about breaking the show down, Jonathan? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of individual episodes we can touch on, certainly. I will say I I really liked particularly the first three or four. I, I really was on its wavelength, I think, in the early going. Episode one, you have in your notes here, you write, I don't even know how to describe what happened in the first episode, and that is so right. I mean, it is... The first episode feels like it could be a dream sequence because it is mm-hmm. such this surreal mix. I wrote in my notes, you know, you could pass this off as like Yamada Naoko and Reiko Yoshida trying to defamiliarize the slice of life genre by doing half a super straight faced atmospheric show with no plot, just kind of vibes and half a Looney Tunes bird flying in to fuck everything up. And it does kind of do that. Um, yeah. But I, I like the dream quality of it. I think that second episode with Kigami Yoshiji directing from uh, Yamada Naoko's storyboards, I wrote, this has big Someday in the Rain vibes. I think it's a beautiful, beautiful episode. It's it's especially with Midori's arc there, and we'll talk about that, um, which leads to a really beautiful scene in the cafe. Um, I really like the Shiori episode. Episode four is about her little sister Anko. I like that. I think it's as it starts getting into, like, I again, I like Dara in the first half when he is a comedy sprinkling on top of things. I think that's fun. I think once you get into Dara's homeland and Choi comes in and then you have the prince in the last two episodes, I just, you know, like in my notes, I'll say like episode seven is all Choi. Episode eight is another Dara one about Dara dieting. I didn't really care for either of those. And then at episode nine, I wrote in my notes, just like after two minutes, I'm like, this is a breath of fresh air. This is amazing. And it is. Episode nine is the Kigami Yoshiji one about um, Tamako's dad singing and learning about the song and getting a big musical number. I mean, you said earlier, this one isn't about music. And in my head, I went, it isn't until it is. <laughs> and when it uh-huh. is, it really matters that it's about music. Um, and then after that, I, yeah, I didn't, I just... I, and I guess we could talk about this now. We could hold on to it later. What, like, didn't work for me with the kind of Dara and the Mochimatsui family stuff. And I'm interested to hear what did work for you about that. But that is where I just, the things I loved about the show, I wasn't really seeing there. And it kind of pulled my attention in other directions. Yeah, I guess, like, like let's just dive into that topic now. Because that obviously seems like the be the biggest thing. Because I guess I never felt like that stuff ended up overpowering anything else in the show to me personally. Like, I think one of the things with Tomiko Market is compared to, say, Kaon, I think it's got a much more kind of pulled out perspective. Like, Tomiko is clearly your main character. Her name's on the show. She is, like, the biggest focal point. But the show has such a bigger scope because yeah. it's not like with Kaon, it's very narrowly focused on the club and the girls in the club. It pulls out a little bit in season two to expand that to Ui and um, June as Azusa's friends. I mean, obviously Ui's in season one of Kaon as well, but she gets a higher level of importance. But even still, it's very narrowly focused on that club. Whereas Tamako Market has, you've got the girls in the Baton Club and all of that, and that's kind of like your most familiar kaon esque space and you've got all that going on you've also got here are all like the random sort of misfits in the shopping district all these weird characters um like the florist and Midori's grandfather um and the woman who runs the like old woman with the purple hair that runs the croquet shop and all that kind of stuff you've got all these like random people in the community of the shopping district You've also got Mochizo in his whole side of the show and his sort of unrequited love for Tamako that obviously eventually becomes sort of the main focus of the movie. And then on top of that is then you've got Dera 
and that starts to bring in Choi and then Mecha at the very end of the show as well. And so since the show has this very kind of big picture view of things and kind of moves around to a lot of different characters, having a lot of different kinds of things going on, different kind of genres get involved um, in different ways, whether you're talking about kind of love story stuff or more traditional slice of life stuff, but all of it focusing around the antics of this very weird, strange shopping district. For me, when the Dara stuff started becoming, you know, it becomes more prominent, I guess, in the second half when you have Choi coming in, but it never felt like it ever overpowered anything to me personally. So, I mean, I agree with that overall assessment of the show, and it's something I like about it. I wrote this when I kind of got to episode four, I think, which is the one about Anko, um, that, like, uh, I actually, I don't know if I would call Tomiko the main character of this show. Like, I guess she's the main character, but, like, kind of in the way that, like, Luffy, this is a weird comparison, but Luffy is the main character of One Piece, but he is very rarely the protagonist of One Piece. One Piece is the protagonist is the people he meets along the way who have stories that he helps along. Tamako Market is about the people Tamako encounters in her daily life. Like, Tamako yes. is, she does not really have much of an arc over the course of this show. The closest thing to that, she does in the movie, and the movie is much more about her, and it is much more about Mochizo, and it's a much narrower slice of life. But, like, if you could say Tamako has an arc, it would be in the final half being presented with this weird princess thing that she could go marry the prince of this island nation and she chooses not to but there's no actual tension in that because she's not going to and we know that because this is her world and she loves it and if we know one thing about tamako by the time we get to episodes you know 11 and 12 it is that she is the most enthusiastic cheerleader for this shopping district and the people in it that there will ever be and this is where she belongs and so what that you know plot line is really doing is underlining who she is and maybe helping her understand that. Although even then, it's more about the other people learning that about her. She is very secure in who she is over these 12 episodes. And so the show is much more anthology style in terms of bouncing around to characters. So episode two is really about Midori um, and her kind of coming to realize her feelings for Tamako. Episode three is about Shiori. Episode four is about Anko and on and on and on. They all kind of bounce around to different characters and do that kind of thing. And I like that about it. I, 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 I wrote my notes like this show I feel like is a really great example of why this genre is sometimes called the atmospheric genre in Japan. Its atmosphere is very heavy. It is about a place. It is about a feeling. It is about being situated in a certain part of the world and a certain kind of rhythm of life. And I think it does that kind of stuff really, really well. As regards the Dara side of it, again, I do enjoy him when he is kind of light sprinkling of comedy. I, I do think it gets pretty heavy in the second half of the show. You know, seven is about Choi and Dara and all of that backstory. Eight is about Dara going on his diet. Um, and then nine and ten kind of go back to other characters. And 11 and 12 go back to kind of being about the Mochimazui family and the bride and all of that stuff. And like, so it's a pretty heavy intrusion into the kind of middle of the show. And I think there's a couple of things. One is I think Dara... If he's on the side, I don't mind. When you put him more and have more and more jokes, he's a very... The jokes are pretty one-note and repetitive. He likes to eat his mochi. He is fat. He needs to eat less mochi and lose weight. Ha, ha, ha. At a certain point, I get a little eye-rolly at that, um, particularly the one that is kind of all about that. Um, I, I don't want to be like, they're body-shaming the bird. I'm not going to be that silly about it. But it did just kind of rub me the wrong way at a certain point, just the repetitiveness of it. Um, and then... Like, I, I can see what they are doing thematically with the Prince and Choi and all of that stuff. The voice acting is obviously very good. This must be a very early Hiro Shimono as the Prince. It is, yeah. And I enjoyed hearing him as a, as a before he's, like, settled into the kinds of voices he does now, um, <laughs> which are more Zenitsu-flavored from uh, mm -hmm. Kimetsu. But anyway, I'm getting off track. I think when we get into that stuff, like, again, I get what it is trying to do thematically, I, I would have been more interested in just spending more time kind of with the people of the shopping district, I guess, is my point of view. And I also, I don't quite know what I think about this, but I think it's worth raising is the kind of racial politics of it are. It is an exoticized, like, fant and it is, it's played on the level of fairy tale and fantasy, and I get that. But it is also juxtaposed next to a very grounded, it's grounded in a kind of, 
heightened area of the world, but it is a grounded slice of life thing. And so you have this kind of stereotypically fantastical island with a king and a prince, and there's a prophecy, and they're all believing in, you know, fortune telling, and they've got their magic birds, and it is exoticized and mystical, and I don't really feel offended by it, but I could understand someone being offended because of the racial coding going on there. You know, I was thinking in like episode 11, like, boy, if an American show did this, Polygon would write 10 different very finger wagging articles about how you are a bad person for enjoying it. And I would roll my eyes at those because I think that would be overdoing it. But I would not be surprised if there was a good critique to be made of that side of the show, particularly because of the contrast with the kind of grounded nature of the rest of it. I hope I'm voicing that in an okay way. I think it's worth broaching. Yeah, I, I guess I, I see where that's coming from. I think the the how heavily it sort of is rolling into this like weird sort of fantasy world made that not stand out to me that much because there's there's sort of a sense of that like they're almost like dreamlike characters um that it, it's yeah but i definitely see that the way they're dreamlike which, yeah, characters who are colored with dark skin the bodyguards that the prince has has yes. the big mr popo lips you yes. know that's it's not the, an accident. the yeah, the episode 12, um, the two bodyguards are the ones that really stood out to me uh, because that's like, they're obviously like um, Choi and Mecha are racially coded regardless, but there is obviously there's like the blackface-ness of that specific style of um, rendering people who have darker skin that is, uh, you know, especially for an American perspective, is really going to stand out to you. Um, that it for sure is, it is playing with that exoticized Im imagery of the kind of like weird sort of Southern Island, you know, there's some sort of Island out there. Like it's, it appears in a lot of Japanese fiction where you have like the dark skinned people that, you know, it's like Mothra um, has the exact same thing of like, here's this sort of mysterious Island out there with people who have darker skin and they have these sort of more kind of old fashioned beliefs where they like of like animism that they like, you know, really believe um, it is a, it is definitely a trope in Japanese fiction. I think it didn't stand out to me a huge amount here, but it certainly is playing into it. Um, it but I didn't, I didn't sort of, it didn't kind of take me out of it, I guess. Okay. I, you know, and again, it's, it's not that like I felt viscerally offended by it. It's more that I am, cur I would be curious to hear the critique from someone who maybe has more formulated thoughts on that side of it, you know, because it is notable. Like it's, it's the darker skin, it's the red eyes. They are coded very similarly to like um, the Ishvalans in Full Metal Alchemist. And like, I forget, what is the name of the native peoples that they're based on in, in Full Metal oh, Alchemist? Oh, the Ainu? The Ainu. There's, so there's, you know, I, I don't know, I don't think that's 100% it, intentional, but it does come from, as you say, this like line of sort of folkloric, but also probably slightly colonial and problematic stereotyping in Japanese fiction that like, again, if, if this were, if this were set in a small town in America and it were native American characters coming in with their headdresses and their like mystical routines, we would critique that. I just know we would mm -hmm. critique that. And so that's why I'm like thinking about that. Yeah, I think the but the for me one of the things that kind of had the Choi and Mecha and Denna part of that that works for me is the way in which her coming in out of this like weird fantasy world puts into perspective how weird the shopping district is, right? Like it's yeah. sort of like because I think part of to me the point of the show and what the show is doing by bringing in these like very strange fantasy things that feel like they do not belong in your slice of life show is to you know make that direct juxtaposition and show that life is as strange as all of these things and that Tamako Tamako is the princess of the shopping district she doesn't need to go marry the prince right her mom calls her Tamako Hime in the flashbacks the same way that her mom calls Anko Anko Hime that Tamako then tells her. Um, as the older sister, right? And so it is sort of saying that, you know, this, like, these people are living that fantasy. They are living that dream life. And there's nothing that can happen in this shopping district that would make them sort of go, like, oh my God, I can't believe it, right? Like, the way everyone sort of sees oh, it's a talking bird. Huh, yeah. that's kind of weird. And then they roll with it, right? Because the talking bird is not the weirdest thing they've seen that day. Um, I think there's something about that that I just adore about it sort of 
celebrating the strangeness of people and the strangeness of life um, by by putting the fantasy in there and saying that it doesn't matter that it's fantastical because it's no more weird than anything else. Sure. And and I like that side of it. Again, I love the characters in the district. I love the moment. You know, there's a scene in the movie, uh, which is just on my mind because I watched it this morning, when Tamako is just like walking through the shopping district saying hi to people. And like, consistently, that's my favorite part of this show, is her just moving through that space and saying hi to everyone and seeing the colorful characters. And I think the show with those characters is, I think, very good at towing the line between they are colorful, but they feel believable. I think everyone in that shopping district feels like someone you could meet. It feels like a very real world. And I think that is, you know, it, maybe it didn't work for me, but I do like the interpretation you're giving of bringing in, like, fantasy that is prima facie ridiculous right like with a, and, yeah. I, and i'm not critiquing the show the show wants you to think it is ridiculous the bird is a projector right like it could not be more fairy tale silly kind of stuff that this this dara and his world is coming from and that being totally quotidian to the people of the shopping district who just kind of roll with it and they want to give these you know incredible foreigners they want to show them all of their goods and wares and food and all that stuff i like those scenes and i and i get the the point that's making even if it didn't uh land for me uh completely yeah um i think for me the other thing is i do just for for Detta, i just really enjoy him as a character tremendously like i think for me that that is the vocal performance of the show to me is yamazaki takumi as Detta, um who is like a great voice actor who's you know been around forever you know he goes back to saint Seiya. he plays a couple of different characters in saint Seiya. um we've seen him as kaneth um from fate zero um he's george de sand in mobile fighter g gundam he is the recast for makuve in gundam the origin um which is a recast that you will like basically not even notice because he's so fucking good at it um he's so good and, at the aristocratic language which you get with dara too he's wonderful yeah. at that yeah, and Detta is just this, such this, like, effusive character. He talks in such an exaggerated fashion, um, and it's such incredible vocal performance. He gets all this great narration that is so beautifully written. Um, we'll get to, like, the last episode where his last line I just love so much. And then also, he is a cartoon character, and KyoAni gets to sort of stretch their legs, where they've never done this for a show in this style. Um, where they have a character that is this malleable, this cartoonish, um, right? Because, you know, we've had like Nietzsche Joe, which has very sort of elastic characters because the show is stylized that way. But this is a show that looks like Kaon or looks like Hyoka or looks like Clanad, right? Any of their sort of like very more realistic shows, it's designed to look like it's being shot on actual cameras. It's doing all that kind of stuff, using the depth of field, all the same like techniques. You know, it's definitely, you can see a lineage from Hyoka to this in terms of how like advanced they have become at using those different techniques to make it feel like it's shot an actual camera. But you also have an incredibly elastic cartoon character here who can transform his bodies and body in crazy ways and change his shape and flap around and do all this crazy stuff. And the animation and the character design of Detta is so good and they get so much mileage out of the character in the way he moves, the way he walks, the way he holds himself. Like, I like the sort of um, almost kind of like camp preening nature of him because he is this tropical bird with these beautiful feathers and he feel like presenting himself, right? Um, and he, how he walks, putting one leg in front of the other in this very methodical fashion. And I think there is a way in which they communicate this very like aristocratic weird bird that feels like he's a bird they've they've picked up on like the body language of those birds that like puff their chest out and have their head held up high and they strut around right and that's what he does and he's presenting his feathers um to the world um and he's doing all of that and they've combined that with the sort of very kind of gooey malleable quality of the mochi that he's meant to represent and so when i was going through and doing screenshots for these episodes like i just found myself constantly taking screenshots of Detta because every shot he's in is so good and the expressions on his face are incredible and the way the character moves is incredible um, that I just think there's so, you, I can feel the love that the production staff have for this character and how they depict him and write him and perform him. And that love is effusive to me. Like every time he's on screen, 
I just I, I adore this character so much. Yeah, I and I don't disagree with any of that. I think he I think it's a tremendous vocal performance that is frequently screamingly funny. There's a moment, I think, in the third episode, or no, it's the beginning of the fourth, where Dara like comes out in the morning and he comes out of the bathroom and says something like kind of rude about having like just taken a dump and so he feels light. And then he goes, and now off I go in search of women, and he flies <laughs> off. And it just fucking kills me. There's moments like that. Again, when when, when it becomes more of the focus, I think he can be a little bit of a repetitive character who kind of swallows the show around him to me. But I will not disagree about, again, that vocal performance is great. The animation on him is absolutely splendid. It's all, you know, it's all over the place. It is, especially because he is such a different character from anyone else on screen. That blend is very impressive. Um, he is, I mean, he's literally very elastic. His shape changes. Uh, the, the way he presents himself changes. Sometimes he's a very kind of flat, two-dimensional character. Uh, I'm saying very Visually, and often he is much more three-dimensional in his kind of rotundness and how he moves through the world. Um, the posing on him is outstanding. Yeah, I mean, all of that stuff is, uh, you know, there's no arguing there. It's very well done. Yeah, it also does the thing I love that anime does that you know that uh, Western cartoons are cowards, that they don't put yes. buttholes on animals yep. because they've yep. got a butthole on Dera and they have fun with that and they will, you know, put that prominently in shots. I'm looking at some of my screenshots from episode eight, which has the whole joke where Kana builds him a little house that's too small yes. and he tries yes. to shove himself in there. And you just have this incredible shot of Choi looking at the little house and there's just <laughs> this little like white puff coming out with the butthole on it and it's like if you think about that it's an incredibly obscene <laughs> thing uh but it's very but it's funny a, but it's an animal it's a you know yeah. i have a dog you see it all the time when they're going out and doing you know their stuff and so it's just it's it, it's also funny um especially because the way they draw it he's a you know it's a pretty detailed character and then the butthole is a little x you know it's yeah. just that's also like a that's a key comedy gag manga kind of thing you know so yeah, yeah i'm into it yeah, so I I I love Dana. So when they, you know, he definitely becomes more of a focus. I think it's 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 pretty particularly episode seven and eight is where I think that like happens because I think eleven and twelve, like it, you know, it technically is a important plot thing that Mechimochi Mazui is there, but really that's not like sort of the tension of the screen time so much. And so for me, it's more like seven and eight is where that becomes a we're really focusing on Choi because she's the new character here and we're kind of like bringing that in and then Dera kind of becomes the focal point, particularly in episode eight with the diet. Um, and, you know, I I like those characters so much that it never really bothered me that it becomes a stronger focus for that stretch. Yeah. Um, do you want to just talk about some of the other characters since we just did a nice little deep dive on Dara, who is the yeah. biggest character in the show, not in stature, but in you know, personality. Yes. <laughs> but yeah. And in heart. There's, yeah. But this is a very, very good cast. Yes. It's a very, I, yeah, I love all these characters. Let's start with our, our uh, lead here with Tamako, um, played by Suzaki Aya, um, who had at this point, she had already had a really big role as Makan Shoku uh, Mako in Kill a Kill, which is the best character in Kill a Kill. That's uh, the main character of Yuko's best friend. If you've seen that show, you know that that's the best character in that show. Um, and then she's been in a bunch of other stuff, some other things. Um, she plays Kaide in Assassination Classroom, which is one of the major characters in that show. She is one of, like, something I've learned is every actress who was in anime in the early 2010s is in Idol Master, because, like, every girl <laughs> in the show is, is the someone in Idol Master. She plays a character named Minami in Idol Master, and she's Shizuka in Knights of Sidonia. Um, and Tamako is just, what a delightful weird character starting with just like the character design i mean that's one thing to say about the show is the character design is incredible yes. um this is where Horiguchi yukiko gets to really stretch her legs because she gets to create the characters from scratch right obviously you know she's done character designs for other shows particularly kaon but that's still based on kakafly's art and like those characters from the manga that she's adapting to the style they want to use for the show here she gets to create all the characters and tamako is just the best character design. I love particularly her hair and she's got like, you know, she's got her hair done to the two pigtails and she's got like the couple little strands that are always just kind of out of place. And it's not exactly the same thing as like your Ahoge style, like saber, you know, having the big whip 
tuft of hair that sticks up. It's not really that. It's much more realistic because people who have their hair pulled in straight like that are going to have a couple of like pieces that just kind of um, uncurl from the the pigtails and are sticking out. Um, and she's so I love the hair design. I think she's got these incredibly expressive eyes. Um, I love that she's got the the detail of her having um, contact lenses in. So sometimes at home and stuff, they put the glasses on her, which helps create like a really nice visual contrast. Um, I just think it's like a character that is in her design and performance in her writing is so lived in, feels so incredibly real. Um, and I think it's really important because the show doesn't have the time or space to focus on her in the same way that like Kaon was able to focus on Yui with the amount of like screen time and stuff like that, because this show has so much else going on. And so I think Tamako, just at like immediate first blush, you get the sense of the entire life that this character has lived and who she is and what she cares about. Um, and I think like every element of the design in the animation and the writing and the voice acting all delivers that character so clearly and vividly. I 100% agree with that. And I think the one criticism I have seen of this show that I will absolutely defend it from is the idea that Tamako is too bland a main character. I have seen that criticism. I can see how someone could come to it in the sense that she is a static character. Static, yes. I think, is often taken to be a bad thing. And it can be a bad thing if the show is unaware of that as a quality. This show is about the ways in which Tamako... Like, the world of the show kind of revolves around her because she is so comfortable and at home. She loves Mochi more than anyone. She loves this shopping district more than anyone. She is very happy here, and and it is much more about kind of... The, we are, the show is much more about seeing the world through her eyes, whereas the movie gets a little bit more, even though it's a narrower focus, is kind of about her being reflexive in a way she never is in the TV show, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think so much of that comes from the character design, as you're saying, Sean, which I agree is is really striking, uh, and the animation of the character. You know, in her own way, she is just one of the most expressive protagonists KyoAni has had, um, because so much of the show is her being, you know, fairly kind of quiet and simple, reacting to sometimes crazy things, sometimes not. Some of what is so. Off-putting is the wrong term because I enjoy this in the first episode. But what is like maybe striking or weird about that first episode is how much she takes the Dara of it all in stride, you know? And that is, mm -hmm. it tells us a lot about her and it also tells us a lot about the show to come. Um, but no, she's great and I think the, the performance is wonderful. I really love Aya Suzaki as, as the character. I like her performance of both the theme songs as well. I just yes. like the way her, I like, you know, she does, the, as you said, reads the titles. Um, I love how she does the next episode previews. I, I like them choosing the line, let's see what kind of mochi we're going to eat next week as like the mm -hmm. kiss off line in the next episode previews is a great line for that. Uh, and so, yeah, I love that character creation at the center of this. And I think the show is very confident in knowing how they want to use that character. Yeah. And as you say, she is a static character in the sense that, like, she never goes through an arc in the TV show. But, like, I think your your understanding of her does evolve as you kind of see more of her background. And especially, like, the stuff with her mom. And you kind of dig a little bit more into her psychology and why she is the way she is and why she cares about the shopping district to the level that she does to make that punch land really hard yeah. in episode 12 when you have the big scene with like Dena running, crying to like deny the prince and all that stuff. Um, so it's, she is, I think just a very rich character. Um, so then we've got um, our, our prince, not the prince prince, but the true prince of the show, which is Mochisa Oji. Um, for people who don't know Oji, it means prince. There are lots of puns. Uh, there's puns up and down the show. Um, voiced by Tamaru Atsushi, who is, I've not seen any of the major shows he's in, but he's in Haikyuu, uh, playing a character named Kunimi. He's in The Regular at Magic High School, who, playing a character named Yoshida Mihihiko. Um, and I love, I love Hachizo. He's just the most puppy dog boy in the world. Um, I was like, he's a character that is really good in the show, but especially the movie, which propels him to like co-protagonist role. Um, he's another character where you can just feel, um, how much the animators enjoy animating him. He's also a character where you can feel 
this is a show that is headed by women. There's something about the way that he is drawn and animated and written that he is, he feels more like a character you would see or like a male character you'd see in a show, um, a shoujo manga compared to a shonen kind of thing. Like there's yes. just a, the, the way the character, the show looks at and thinks about and animates the character. He's very kind of effeminate in certain ways, um, in a way that I think I, I really like. His reactions and his responses are very kind of stereotypically girlish. Like he'll like cup his hands around his mouth and stuff. He will blush very readily. You know, he kind of like holds his arm and is very like sort of awkward and shy off to the side because he doesn't know how to express his feelings. Um, it's a, it's just a very different kind of male character than you would typically see, um, in these sorts of shows, because you wouldn't normally get a male character in these sorts of shows, is another thing to just sort of mention. Yeah. You know, Kaon doesn't have any prominent male characters in it at all. There's, like, a couple of guy teachers or whatever, but there's no one who's, like, a main, main character. Um, and so the slice of life genre often vies away from male characters for a whole variety of reasons but it does make like the fact that this show does have a prominent male character front and center and then evolves that into a whole kind of like love story thing in the movie it's one of the things that makes this series really stand out amongst its peers absolutely uh, you know one of the things that makes episode nine the event that it is is the number of crisscrossing character arcs going on in that one where you have the father, you have uh, the sister Anko, and she's acting weird because of the crush she has on this boy, and you have um, Mochizo and Tamako, and Mochizo being a little like uh, sad because it seems like Tamako has forgotten his birthday, and one of my absolute favorite moments in the whole show is when Tamako... I don't think she was even trying to plan it as a surprise. She's just oblivious. But at the last moment, she pulls, you know, whips out this birthday cake mochi that she has made for him and gives it to him. And he, like, cups his hand over his mouth, as you were saying, Sean, and starts crying as the credits come up. Uh, and that is, like, more than anything in that episode, that's the moment that got me. And there's a lot of moments in that episode that get you because that is a that episode is a roiling series of emotional climaxes. Um, and I love that stuff. And then, yeah, absolutely. I think he is wonderful in the movie. I think the performance by um, that actor Atsushi Tamaru is particularly in the movie. Just fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, it's just it's such a refreshing character. You just don't usually see a, a male character presented like that in something that's not a straight like again, shoujo romance story or whatever, which this kind of in some ways becomes that in the film, which is fine. Um, but it, I, I just was very struck by the way this show uses the character in the TV because and, I've watched yeah. a lot of slice of life shows. Slice of life shows usually do not like have a male character. They're so thoughtful about like this. Yeah. And I, I think he also feels just extremely real to me, particularly yes. the movie focuses on this more. But a background detail is that he's in the film club. Mm -hmm. And yes, he is absolutely a film school boy. I don't I don't yes. even know how else to say it there. I, I see students every day that remind me of Mochizo. Uh, he is a film school boy, but like one of the good ones, not one of the ones who will go in and tell you about, you know, how Tarantino is the best feminist ever. And if you don't get that, you're a misogynist. I mean, a good film school boy who really wants to learn and be curious. Yes, uh, because he also has his two buddies that I also love that you get more of in the movie with like the dude yes. who's got like the big mop hair. And then he's got his one little buddy who has the glasses, who's just like a voice actor thing I thought was like very interesting. That character is voiced by Yamashita Daiki. Um, who people would now know as Deku, the main character in My Hero Academia. This is like one of his absolute first ever roles in an wow. anime ever is as this little, he's got like a handful of lines. He's mostly, he's only in, I think, two episodes in the show. So he's mostly in the movie, but that's a little voice actor shout out. Uh, it kind of reminds me of when we watched um, uh, Gun uh, Gundam Age and you have uh, Matsuki Yoshitsugu is just one of like the background dudes and it's like yeah. the second thing he was ever in. You're like, oh my God, I'm very used to hearing this guy's voice because he's in like everything and then he's also like a char very famous character um, and you're not used to hearing that come out of like random like background character C, you know? Uh, yes. So that's a fun little thing there. That's awesome. All right, so then, so that's uh, Mochizo. Uh, then we've got uh, Shiori, um, who is voiced by Yamashita Yudie, um, who this was her first big kind of anime role. And really, she hasn't been in a lot of anime. Her voice acting stuff is kind of in kind of other spheres, like narration and commercials and things like that. Um, but I definitely, I really love Shiori. I love particularly 
episode three, which is the big Shioti episode, was the first episode that to me was like a, oh my god, this show. Um, like I really I thought episode one and two were really good, obviously, but episode three was the one where I felt like this show is something really special. Um, and because I think that's also where it could sort of stood out that the show was going to move its focus to a lot of different places. Yes. Um, and that whole episode and the way they kind of realized this character, that I think on the face of it is like a character you've seen in a lot of anime, the shy bookish girl with the glasses and stuff like that. Um, but it, the character just feels so real to me and kind of think breaks out of the kind of like, anime character archetype she usually fits in partially because that can anime character archetype is almost always used in a show with a male protagonist to have her be a potential love interest right it's one of your like handful of stock character personalities like tsundere that if the random harem romance show would be thrown in there um you know like we had like a similar sort of character in clonade and stuff like that um but here you know that's not obviously the focus at all and so the way in which it sort of looks at her issues of being shy, having difficulty making friends, not knowing how to put herself out there. Um, it feels so relatable and feels so well observed and realized in the way the character expresses those ideas. And then I love how after episode three, she just is like one of the buddies that shows up and she like provides like helpful insight and things like that. She's got a couple of like really pivotal scenes in the movie um, that she can help with because she's got that kind of slightly more removed and mature perspective on things. Um, she's just a great, great character. Absolutely. And I love that episode. I all For all the things you're saying, I like... That one is some of my favorite use of Dara specifically because of how mm -hmm. he in that episode becomes kind of this... It's, it's, it's the kind of Greek chorus effect where he is kind of this thing in the background kind of moving between parts of the show. He becomes this kind of chord connecting the Shiori side over to the Tamako side as they get closer and closer and kind of bouncing back and forth between those. And of course, his relationship with Shiori, who he falls in love with, is very funny. Yeah, I think it's a very, very good episode. And, uh, you know, that character, I like how she... The show never really focuses on her again to that extent, but I like that she is just part of the gang from that point forward. So then we have what might of like competing with Dera as my favorite character in the show um, is Kanna, who is voiced by Nagatsuma Judy. Um, who we will see more of because she's in a bunch of QA stuff after this. She plays um, Shmiya Satone, who is the, I believe that is like the main, the big new character that's introduced in season two of Love, Chinibio, and Other Delusions. If I remember correctly, that's what that character is. She also plays a character from an episode of Myriad Colors Phantom World. Uh, the big other thing, though, she's been in, I have not actually watched the show, it's been on my watch list forever, is Yuki Yunoa Yusha Deyaru. Um, I don't remember what the English title of that is. Um, but she plays one of the main three characters in that show. Um, but Kanna is our, you know, the daughter of a carpenter who their favorite thing in the world is a good angle and a sturdy shelf. Um, and this fucking character is so incredibly funny. I love her to death. All the gags about her wanting to measure things and yes. like the way she like views the world in this just incredibly different way. Her weird sense of humor, her relationship with Detta, who she calls Mr. all the time for no discernible reason whatsoever, um, is just incredible, you know, and that she really looks out and likes Mr. a lot, even though she's got a bird allergy, which is, uh, you know, an issue when the bird comes from a culture that views sneezes as proposals. Um, and it's just, I, I just love her to death. All the like the little expressions on her face, you know, because she's a very sort of like flat character in terms of how she expresses herself, but they find so much nuanced space to find little expressions and little smirks and things like that um, in her character design. I just think she's just an absolutely delightful character. I agree. And I think there's kind of an arc for me with the show of where Dara... Uh, takes up a lot of the comedy oxygen in the first couple of episodes because he is so much bigger in personality than anyone else, right? But I feel like in the second half, especially where I was getting a little tired of Dara's antics, I feel like uh, Kana really like took over the comedy for me of the show, where in the second half, there's also just more of her. You get the whole episode about the Baton Club that I think is episode 10, um, and some more focus. She's so funny. And then in the movie... One of the things I love about the movie is that the movie has a, a narrower focus on Tamako and her friend group. And so there's just more of the core kind of 
club dynamic a la something we would get in Kaon going on in the movie and I think she just completely steals the show it is such a tremendous comedy performance I love just the weird way she says everything is kind of infectious and makes me excited to see her in other stuff like Love Chinibio or even this uh, the show by the way in English is Yuki Yuna is a hero just to okay so yeah, that's pretty appreciate literal. for translation yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway makes me want to that, that, I like the poster for that show looking at it looks fun yeah but it's just I I just have never seen a character before that whose whole gimmick was being the daughter of a carpenter and taking that very seriously <laughs> and it's so good. The whole bit in the movie where she's like they're talking about like how would you like confess to people or whatever she's like build me a house. <laughs> <laughs> like that's, that's what I would tell. Build yes. me a house. Uh, that's that's amazing. Um, Build me a house, and then the the kiss off to that being uh, Tomiko just flaw like uh, unconsciously just saying it when she tries to yell at uh, yes. Mochizo is hilarious. Yes. Yeah. Um, so then we have uh, Midori Tokiwa, who is voiced by Kanako Yuki, um, who we will see again in Silent Voice. She plays Naoka in Silent Voice, um, who's one of the main characters in that. Um, and she is also another girl that is in Idol Master as a character named Takamori Aiko. I don't know anything about Idol Master, but she has like might be easier, credits. Sean, just to say when girls aren't in Idol Master at this yes. point. Well, it's just one of those where it, you know I always put it in there when I look up their credits and see fifty different things that say the yes. Idol Master on there. I'm like, well, it must be an important role because there's so many credits for it. Um, yeah, Midori is a really interesting character. This is another character that like I did not expect this dynamic in this show. I was was very surprised um that i was like just shocked that the show has a love triangle at its core um yes. like it's not what the show focuses on that much um but you know midori is a girl who is in love with tamako and it's like very like sort of plainly clear that that's what it's saying that's the kind of relationship she wants to have and doesn't know how to go about it um and she's also someone who is socially observant enough to like see the relationship dynamics that are going on i think she kind of knows in her heart that probably like tamako does feel about mochizo the way that we understand by the end of the movie um i think she probably really kind of knows that fairly early on and it's just kind of on the edges of it and it's just it's a very i think effective character who you you there's a lot going on with her and she's got this kind of very rich kind of internal emotional development that she doesn't express much outwardly. And so you have that episode two that really kind of is the Valentine's day episode that gives you that insight. And then you got a couple of episodes over the course of it, like the beach episode, episode five that pick up on that thread again. And the, the sort of like love triangle dynamic between her, Tomiko and Mochizo. And then obviously that also is a thing that features in the movie. But it is a thing that gives this kind of more dramatic structure and like heart at something buried deep into the show than you normally would get in a slice of life. Like slice of life shows would avoid, I think, like, you know, this kind of love triangle sort of structure in something that has this very kind of bitter quality to it um, emotionally of having this like truly unrequited love. Uh, but I think she's just such a fun, interesting character that explores all those different dynamics and has such a powerful internal life that you see expressed. It's one of my favorite parts of this show. I do think, you know, I, I noted the three for me are episodes two, three, and nine, and I think they're all great. My favorite really is the second episode. I, I think that is just... Like, I wrote in my notes, Sean, because we had when I watched that, we had just recorded the episode you guys heard last week on Love, Chinibio, and Other Delusions. And you, um, for good reason, went on and on about the sixth episode, which was a Kigami Yoshiji one and just about, like, how unbelievably well-directed that was. That was my feeling about the second episode of this show. It is... And it's one of the simplest episodes. It's just kind of variations on a theme, and the theme is Valentine's Day. There's no real drama, but there's so much subtlety to everything moving through just how do the people in this shopping district process and, and go through the Valentine's Day of it all. And I think when you get to Midori's arc and the, and the show kind of lands on her in the second half of that episode as our real point of view of the episode, and there's just a long quiet scene that leads to this sequence with her listening to the record in the cafe which is my favorite setting on this show mm -hmm. and kind of processing her emotions and and getting us in the audience without 
like that's the thing Midori never comes out and says I am in love with Tamako like it is all done subtly kind of through intimations and through visual language and that kind of thing but I think it really lands hard and there is a melancholy because it feels like she knows Tamako probably will not or cannot reciprocate in that same way uh, and also probably since also that like and in that episode it's very explicit that this is unexpected for Midori too like I think mm-hmm. she is coming to terms with you know what that feeling is moving from probably friendship to love what that says about her own sexuality the way all of that is played in that episode I just think there's a level of like subtlety and beauty to it that uh, again I wrote in my notes big big someday in the rain vibes from this one because of how much it is about atmosphere and feeling and things that are not said but come through to the viewer very clearly and that's one of the reasons why all the way to the end Midori is one of my favorite characters and I think her role in the movie is also beautiful and tremendous and she gets uh, this gorgeous final shot in the movie she just rocks yeah she's amazing because you also have kind of episode 10 kind of comes back to being another Midori episode because that's the one where they're getting ready to do the big show Yes. And she kind of takes on the responsibility to come up with the choreography, but she doesn't know how to do it. Um, episode 10 is definitely like the like K.O.N. episode um, because it's like the yes. one that's about the club. And you can definitely like see the exact same basic episode, only it's Ditsu instead of Midori who's taken on this responsibility. But I also love in that episode, you get a lot of scenes set in Midori's room. And I love seeing her like you know, lounging around on her bed. She's got this teddy bear that she plays around with that later she gives a teddy bear to Choi in the last episode, which is uh, really great. Um, And she, you know, I just like seeing that sort of sense of her, you know, frustration and and how she sort of like messes around in her room and creates this big mess and all this stuff and then has to clean it all up dramatically when Tomiko and all of them come over. Um, There's, again, there's just this like real sense of kind of drama and internal life to Midori that's so vivid. Um, it's such a, such a great character, um, as with all the characters on the show, really. Yeah. Um, and then we've already done Deda, so that, like, really leaves the sort of wider cast of people to run through, because there's a lot of characters that think we need to hit on all of them. But there's one vocal performance in particular we do need to talk about, because I... Can I guess which one you're going to say? Yeah, go ahead. Is it Ono Daisuke? Yes. So we get Ono Daisuke back. You know, he's our he's our Kyoani boy. He's been with us from the very beginning. He will continue to be with us after this point as well, um, because he goes all the way through. He's also in Kobayashi's Made Dragon. So we will be with our lovely boy Ono D for a while here. Um, But this is such an incredible character. I mean, you know, you don't she doesn't get a lot of screen time, but just the idea of you have this florist Kaudu. Um, Kaudu Hanase, Hana means flower, so, you know, everyone's got a pun. Yes. Um, but she uh, runs the flower shop. It is this, like, beautiful, like, Marilyn Monroe-looking, like, extravagant woman with, like, this big blonde hair that is voiced by Ono Daisuke. And it is a thing you constantly have to remind yourself of watching the shows. You're like, oh, right, that's Ono Daisuke. Like, that's not a woman voicing this character. Um, and it's so interesting. Like, I don't know if the intention is that the character is meant to be trans necessarily, like there's nothing in there that like, they never tip their hat in that direction. The only thing would be the vocal performance of casting a male actor to play the character. Like, I don't know what the intention was there, but it's such a seamless performance. Like you would never know. Like, I don't think you'd, if you didn't know who Ono Daisuke was, I don't think you'd even realize that it wasn't a female voice actor. I think you might, I mean, I, I think I think you're meant on some level to realize it, but I think it's also meant to kind of underline how little it matters. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. uh, it is seamless. It's a beautiful performance. I mean, I was just thinking the other day about, you know, one of my favorite things about anime is how much, like, real gender bending there is in casting in a way that just does not exist in, you know domestic forms of art we have here in the United States, or popular art at least, uh, in that, you know, you so frequently have, uh, particularly women playing men in anime, um, up to and including a woman like Masako Nozawa playing a whole family of men and their clones and everything, right? Um, and all of that stuff. And it, it, it runs less hard in the other direction, where it is obviously not unheard of, but it is less frequent to have men playing women. But I, but you do see it in anime. This is a good example of it, and I like it. And it's just, these are talented people. Let them rip. Let them yeah. play whoever they want. Like it's, I would like to see more things like this, because Daisuke Ono, that's the thing, is he's not disguising his voice, really. Like, it's, it's, it's different, 
if you know that voice, as you and I do, his list of credits that you've given us is a lot of things we've talked about, um, you know, you can tell it's him. And I think if you took a step back and were thinking about it, you could tell it's a man. But it is it is so in kind of the tonality, in the writing, in the delivery. Um, and I think it's it's done in such a way that if your read on that character is that they are trans, you can do that and nothing in the show is stopping you. And it can be a very like... I think empowering and beautiful vision of that as a character who is very accepted within their setting. And if you just want to read it as this character is a woman and they've cast a man in the part because Daisuke Ono does a really good job with it, you can do that too. And that's actually something I really like about it. Yeah, it is just, it's such a, a seamless, flawless vocal performance. It's it's kind of mind blowing. It is a thing that like, it makes you realize they should just do that more. Like they should yep. just <laughs> let more male character, male voice actors play women you know obviously i did there's some for whom it might be a little bit harder um you know like not gonna judge you maybe would have a hard time <laughs> you know with how deep his voice is uh but like odo daisuke it's like man dude that you know because it's it's because it's interesting because it's like it's just like a few degrees off from his uh itsuki performance yes. from haruhi like it's really it's amazing how like you just a couple of like modulations from that like kind of soft-spoken polite character he played in haruhi just a couple of modulations and it's just yeah that's just an adult woman and you wouldn't really think twice about it it's it's crazy well you know one thing i thought about that uh, that was it was like has Hanai Natsuki ever done this? Are there any cases where he's played because he could do that so flawlessly? Yes. The couple of episodes of Demon Slayer season two, the Entertainment District, where he is playing Tanjiro as a woman in the like brothel, he is so good at it. It's scary. I want that. That's an actor. There's a bunch of actors I think in like this that generation that could do this really compellingly. Yeah, I think the thing with Hanai Natsuki that one is also that like he's. Pro- I think he's making it worse than he could just because it has yes. to be Tanjiro, not just him. He could do it even better than yes. that. Yeah, it's totally. crazy. Yeah, Tanjiro isn't a professional actor. Uh, Hanai Natsuki is. Yes. Um, then some of the other characters here, uh, we've got our... I fucking love these two characters. you got the two dads. I love yes. the dads of this show too, so them. much, and especially the casting. So you've got um, Mochizo's dad, Gohei, who is voiced by Tachiki Fumihiko, um, whom people would best know as Gendo from Beyond Genesis Evangelion. But he's, of course, in a million things. He's Kimpachi in Bleach. He's Hasegawa, one of the main characters in Gintama. He's Sakazuki in One Piece. He's Sloth in Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. And we kind of go back pretty old school with him because he's been in two Gundam things. He was Muron Muron in Turn A Gundam, which he's like one of the, the hippie dudes um, in Turn A Gundam. But we go back way further because you go back to Victory Gundam. He's Watery Gilla. One, just <laughs> pause on that name for a second. Watery Gilla. Very good. Um, who's a character. He's only in one episode of Victory Gundam. If you've seen Victory Gundam, you know who this guy is because he's yes. in one of the early episodes where he's the guy who fights Uso and then realizes that Uso is a child and starts weeping at that fact, the fact that like a child has been forced to do this. He basically blows himself up with a grenade rather than I, have to face the reality of that. I vividly remember that. It is a terrifying, heartbreaking part of that show. No, I love this performance. And it threw me for a loop the whole show, but in the best way in that my main associations with this actor are as villains, as Gendo in Neon Genesis Evangelion, yeah. or as Sakazuki in, in One Piece, who is one of the main villains of One Piece. He will be one of the final people Luffy has to punch. Um, and so that's where I know that voice. But Gohei is such a like loving, softer character um, who has his edge, but like... It's I love hearing him kind of turned in that other direction here. Yeah, and I just love his like big goofy weird store. It's like they, he's like trying to embrace all these hip new modern trends. You know, he names his store like OZ because yes. they're the OG family. Um, it's just amazing. And then of course he has the eternal rival rivalry with Mami Dai, Tamiko's dad, who is voiced by the late great Fujiwara Keiji. Um, who had tragically passed away several years ago at this point, um, who's also in a million things. We talked about him on Japan Mission Station because he's Hughes in Full Metal Alchemist. Um, that's that one where, like, when I read the manga, I was like, I don't even need to look up who they yes. cast for this character because, of course, they cast him. Um, we talked about him on uh, Weekly Suit Gundam because he's Ali Al Sachez in Gundam Double O, the kind of the terrorist who um, kind of took uh, Cessna under his wing when Cessna was a child and turned into a child soldier and all that stuff. 
Um, he's also Leorio in Hunter Hunter. He's Reno in Final Fantasy VII, which from what I understand, um, in Rebirth, they basically kind of wrote that character out of some scenes in Rebirth because they're going to recast him in the third one because Fujiwara passed away while Remake, I think, around the time when Remake came out. He's also, if you're Japanese, you would also know him as Tony Stark, Iron Man in the Marvel movies because he's the Japanese voice of Tony Stark in those films. So Fujiwara Keiji, just an all-time great. It's so sad that he passed away. Um, but it's a, it is just a phenomenal performance as Mame Dai, as Tamako's dad. It's like, it's a great performance for most of the show as like this kind of gruff dad who, you know, has a heart of gold, but runs this, like the traditional mochi store. And he's like, you know, turns his nose up at all the ridiculous, like trend cat chasing that, uh, the OG family does across the way. But then you get to episode nine and it's just, you realize uh, in some ways this whole show has just been about Mame Dai. This is Mame Dai's show and Tamako's is kind of borrowing it. Um, yes. because it's this kind of generational love story in so many ways. Um, and getting to see that and having him sing the song and all of that stuff, like what a character and what a performance Mame Dai is. Absolutely. And I just, it must, and it's such an exciting role to offer to someone like Keiji Fujiwara, probably of like the range they're asking him to go through by the end of the series that you don't expect there at the beginning. Um, it's wonderful. And we shouldn't uh, forget either the grandfather while we're talking about the dads. Yes. Um, Fuku Kitashira Kawa, uh, who is Tomomichi Nishimura, who was also, you know, in a bajillion different things. Um, I think uh, we would have seen him as Jamatov Hymim on the Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam. Yes. He's M. Bison in Street Fighter and Akuma. Um, so a million different things. But I really like him as the grandpa here, too. Yes. Yeah. The grandpa is also phenomenal. Um, let's see some of our other characters. Uh, we also have Anko, the little sister, uh, voiced by Hidaka Adina, who is in like so many things now. Um, she's uh, Silica in Sword Art Online. She's Milam in uh, the Slime Reincarnation show. I just read his tense in my notes because I didn't <laughs> bother to want to write that whole title out. You know what it is. Um, uh, Misuzu in Tomachan is the girl, which that's a fun show. Um, Didichio in Inu X Boku or Inu Boku SS, um, which that's kind of an old school show. She's also Last Order, the clone um, character in certain scientific railgun. Very great actress. Um, Anko, just the most adorable character in the world. You've got the episode four, which is the Anko episode where she's got the crush on the boy. And I love the, the whole thing where they all think it's like the generic cool sports boy. At the yes. end, it's like the adorable boy, sciencey boy with the glasses that gets her an ammonite fossil, um, you know, which would melt the heart of any eight year old girl um, getting I also you know, like, a fossil. Uh, yes. I also like that Anko is seemingly the only character who is aware that she is in a show where everyone is named after a pun and she doesn't yes. like it. Because Anko, if you don't know, is red bean paste. Uh, and she's like, no, call me on. She eventually gives up on it because she realizes she is in the nut house with everyone else. But uh, she does not want her name to be a pun. And I do understand if I were a little girl and everyone else had a pun name, I'd be a little upset about it, too. Yes. It's one of my favorite details of Deda's character, though. So he always calls her on. She tells yes. him the first time they meet, like, no, my name is on. And he he never budges from yes. that because Deda is a man of honor and, and respect. <laughs> um, Absolutely. But yeah. Yeah, but Anko, I mean, just like, it just has to be emphasized how fucking adorable that character is, though. Just, it's, you know, QAnny getting to do a cute, like, little 10 year old girl and, like, her whole life and stuff. Uh, it's amazing. It feels like she's basically like if you turned back the clock five years on Azusa, this is like, that's who Anko is. And I just, I love it. It's such a fun, yes. little, adorable character. Um, and then, then your got... list of credits here, Sean, I mean, it just yes. goes on and on. Because it's, uh, I guess there's one or two more we want to talk about specifically, but I just, it's, it is a crazy deep cast. Like, it's one of the yes. biggest casts for any KyoAni show, and this is a short show, it's only 12 episodes, but it, it goes on and on and on, because this is such an ensemble-focused series. Yeah, I mean, I, I, in my notes, I gave up at a certain point listing out people because there were too many, so I only went to, like, the ones that I was, like, were, like, very particularly prominent to me. Um, so a couple other ones to hit really quick. So we've got our Mochi Mazuis, um, we kind of talked about already, uh, Shimano Hiro is, uh, Mecha Mochi Mazui, which I, I do have to say, I love the puns on the Mochi Mazui, uh, Mazui means bad, obviously Mochi is Mochi, so whenever they say it, everyone at the Mochi store is like, what the hell are you talking about? Um, Choi, of uh, Choi Mochi Mazui, Choi means a little, so when she says, oh, my name is Choi, Choi Mochi Mazui, he's like, and the dad goes, 
Oh, well, if it's Choi, well, if it's only a little, I guess yeah. that's fine. But then the prince shows up and he says his name is Mecha Mochi Masui, Mecha meaning a lot. And they're like, what the hell is wrong with this kid? Uh, it's <laughs> so good. And then you have them saying like, well, if you get married, then your name would be Tamako Mochi Matsui. And Tamako's like soul leaves her body. Yes. And the notion of her name being Tamako Mochi sucks, basically. Yeah. Um, but anyways, you got for Choi, you've got Yamaoka Yuri um, playing Choi, whom we will see um, just in the next episode, because she is one of the main characters in Beyond the Boundary, Aishindo, she is also in Sound Euphonium. It's a character named Yuko. Um, so you'll see more of this actress. I do really like um, that vocal performance as Choi. Um, and, and her, I like her whole, like, her kind of comedy routine she has with Dead Eye, I find very funny. She's very good, yes. All right. Um, and then the other one, and, and what is like my, I know I've probably said like for five characters that they're my favorite character, but I realized I'm actually wrong. I, I know who my true favorite character is, um, which is Kunio Yaobi, who I don't know if they ever actually even say his name on the show, but he is the coolest dude in the show because he's the guy who runs the record store slash coffee shop. Yes. Um, and he, he is voiced by Tsujitani Koji, who we, we know very well from Weekly Suit Gundam because he is Seabook in Gundam F91 and Bernie in Double Eighty War in the Pocket. Sadly, Koji Tsujitane passed away many years ago at this point. Um, but, oh my God, what a character and what a, yes. with just everything about that character and his shop and his writing, the way that character is used, that is like the thing. Like, Tamako Market is the only show that would have that exact mixture of things this weird hippie dude running a record store slash coffee shop who speaks in weird you know um sort of riddle metaphors that always are going to help people along their way and he gives them like a smile and a nod and gives them a, a you know a cup of coffee that helps them sort of get through whatever they're dealing with um, while he plays like weird, obscure prog rock records and shit. Like <laughs> if you look up the credits for the songs they pulled for the record store, it's the weirdest, most obscure shit you have ever seen in your life. And they have like the album covers and all that are phenomenal. Um, but this man, record store man, he is the best. What a character. I, I could not agree more. This is my most enthusiasm I probably have about the whole show is that setting that character, that place. It's one of those parts that feels like, okay, somebody in the leads on this show, whether it was Yamada Naoko or Reiko Yoshida or whoever, knew someone like this. Like, this is just yes. too, like... I don't know if you could imagine something like parts of it you could. Obviously, it is a somewhat archetypal character of the wise, you know, kind of bartender or whatever. But it's all of the pieces coming together of the kinds of music he plays, the way his shop is laid out, the way the shop looks, the the kinds of way people meet up and sit on the end there uh, of the table, um, the way it's this weird mix of kind of Eastern and Western stuff in there. He's got like drawings of the Eiffel Tower on the wall. Um, he's got these big clocks and paintings it's it's such a wonderful setting and character and yeah probably the most tamako market ish thing about tamako market is just that place yeah it, it definitely is like this the set basically in the show they have the most fun with it it's like every scene in there always just sort of is visually so striking and the the just the kind of geography of that store just invites i think the directors to come up with these really interesting framings and stuff um, it's so good. And he just has some of the best lines. I quoted a couple of them because he always, you know, he always just gets that one little nugget in there. So like in episode three, this is the first one that I, that struck me so much. I put in my notes, um, at the end of episode three or not at the end, like around the midpoint of episode three, because he gives this to Shioti that kind of helps her decide to go tell Tamako that she wants to be friends. He tells her there are times when music can say more than words. Sometimes I think, ah, if only all words were songs. Yes. What a line. What a fucking line. I, um, I love that. And then there's a couple of others I think I pulled into my notes here. Let's see. Where's one of the other ones I wrote down? Um, here we episode go. 10, episode 10, you have one? Um, yes. In episode 10. Yes, God, this one's so good. In episode 10, he says, If you think that music is just made up of sounds, you'd be wrong. Silence, too, is a part of music. Hell yeah. yeah, that's that's my boy. And then in episode 11, I, this one's also so good. Episode 11, he says, Sometimes, letting go of the important things lets us gain something else. Perhaps, simply having them close by isn't really happiness. 
It's my man. It's very good. He's my man. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wonderful stuff. Love that character. Uh, again, very, very unique. And he's got some good moments in the movie, too. Yes. Um, and so I think that's all the, you know, you obviously you have a lot of the other characters like in the shopping district and stuff like that. And all like everybody's good. Anyone who pops up in the show like is a striking, memorable character. Um, but we'd be here all day if we wanted to run down all of those. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, we've hit several of our favorite episodes just talking through all of that. What other specific episodes did you want to zero in on as we continue talking about the show specifically? Um, I think I've like, let's just dig a little bit deeper into episode nine because episode yes. nine is like, it's the one, right? It's the, it's the turning point in many ways. I mean, it's to show that they, it's the episode they mark as being special because it's the only one where Tomiko doesn't read the title. Um, and also they don't have the ending credits. So it's like they knew when they were making it, this is the episode. Um, but that's, you know, it's directed and storyboarded by Kigami Yoshiji. And this is this episode that is this turning point for the show where, it is going from this kind of phase where they've introduced to Choi and they had the kind of Choi stuff for two episodes. Um, and then now it's about kind of like shifting this into this new mode um, to bring us towards the ending of becoming much more introspective and reflective on the past. So the episode opens with your big flashback of um, Tamika's mom visiting Mame Dai at the store, the Tamiya store, um, when he was, when they were both kids and she, you know, they have this whole weird mix up over his name, Mame Dai, which is a pun on the Mame Daifuku, um, which is a thing you would get at a mochi store. Uh, and that sort of serves as this framing device where you go through the whole episode and you kind of, the episode is looking at these different relationships, uh, bringing back things like you have Anko's crush of the boy with the glasses. You've got all the stuff with like Mochizo and his sort of stuff with um Tomiko on the side and he's kind of trying to help Anko Tomiko's trying to help Anko um and all of this sort of like love story thing in the middle through Anko is being used to reflect on that larger story um from the beginning of Mame Dai's relationship where you come back home Mame Dai's there he sees his guitars he gets out his guitars he starts singing this song which is the song that Tomiko has been trying to remember for the whole show that her mom used to sing to her, but she can't remember. She comes home, hears it, busts in on her dad, drags her dad physically to the record store, which I love, where we also now learn that the record store guy also was in her dad's band and they were all buddies in high yes. school, which is another phenomenal detail. And you get this amazing scene where they play the tape of uh, Dynamite Beans, which was the name of the dad's band was Dynamite Beans. And it's him singing the song to um, Tamako's mom. You also see um, the grandpa, who would have been the dad, I think, is supposed to be there because there's a guy with like white hair in a Hawaiian t-shirt in the video, which I want, I, I, I'm just going to say that that's the grandpa because it's got to be what yes. that dude looked like when he was younger. Um, and I think there's something so beautiful about this whole story of this generational aspect of um, you have this line that was originally introduced in episode two, the Valentine's Day one, and comes back here at the end where Dennis says, everybody loves somebody. Um, and then he repeats that line in Japanese. Like he says it in English, and then he repeats it in Japanese, that every there's everybody has someone that they love. Um, and it's this sort of universal thing that ties all these people together and ties these families together and ties this community together is love. And even when the mom is gone, like the memory of that still lives on and is passed down to the mommy dies children. And just the way that this whole sequence is shot and framed and edited with the music and you get these really great shots of the dad that then crossfade into him when he was a kid waiting at the gates and practicing the song and all this kind of stuff. You see the confession scene that then the movie um, reflects where um, he confessed to the mom and then she runs away because she's too embarrassed to do it. And that's what prompts him to write the song, which is a plot point that the movie picks up and reflects on. Um, and then it comes back out and it crossfades back into the dad again. And just the way that they reflect that passage of time for that character and seeing like the age and the wrinkles on his face and all of that. Um, and then that transitions into Tamako giving Mochizo the cake that causes him to cry. Uh, it's just 
my God, this episode. And then it ends with him, with the father going in and looking at the pictures in his notebook where he drew and was writing all the lyrics and trying to design that song. And he still has that notebook and has the pictures of the mom eating uh, a piece of uh, uh, mochi in there. It's, it is just the most like get up applaud last like eight minutes of an episode of anime you have ever seen in your life. It's tremendous. It is, uh, you know, these cascading character arcs kind of coming together and bouncing off each other, past and present bouncing off each other. I think the fluidity with which they cut between the old version of Mamadai and the young version of Mamadai, where it's the same drawing of him, basically, but the lines kind of get added in. It's a beautiful kind of fade that only animation could do. Um, and I think one of the things that most, that's most amazing about this episode is Annie has made this episode like seven times in other uh -huh. shows, right? Like several of the key shows have versions of this. It's, I mean, very reminiscent of plot points in Clannad and Kanon. Yes. Um, we have seen, you know, Lucky Star is also an episode that is, there's a show that is generally lighter, but then has one episode that is about the kind of absent mother figure that does a very similar thing and is about kind of the father being a, a richer kind of character than you thought initially. Um, you know, we, we see this kind of thing over and over from Annie. Uh, and they keep doing it very, very well. Yeah, and it's just, it, it's it's so emotionally impactful. Um, yeah. and, and it's all, you know, it's all fueled by so much of, like, the way that Kigami frames the action and stuff. And there's stuff, like, in the first half of the episode, there's some scenes that I think, like, the way that they're directed and framed are so phenomenal. Like, you have all the stuff of them pounding the mochi um, which I also love. There's a little moment where Choi looks at it and is like, oh, that's like our like traditional dance that we have as well. And she starts yes. doing the dance and Dan's like, she's dancing, she's dancing. Oh, Choi, 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 she's having fun. And the way that the, the, the Dare's actress is line is amazing. But then the camera moves into inside the house where Anko is there and she's squished herself up against this wall. And then um, Oji comes in and tries to talk to her and she like, pushes herself against the wall and turns away. And then Tamako comes in and kneels in front of her and gives her the bag to go give the boy. And you just feel the relationship between the sisters expressed so powerfully and the way that that shot there, that whole sequence is edited and composed together and the way that the relationships between Anko and Oji versus Anko and Tamako and the different sort of like connections that they have get expressed and how Tamako is able to kind of get through to her in this specific way because of Tamako's history. Um, it's just, you know, it's that thing where Kigami is just like the best at this shit. Um, it's, it's so phenomenal. Um, and every single scene in that episode, you get the sense of how the framing and the editing expresses these character relationships and internal dynamics so vividly and powerfully. Yeah. Absolutely. No, no disagreement on this one. It's outstanding. Yeah. Um, and then I would like to talk about uh, the last episode also. Is there another episode, Jonathan, that you'd want to deep dive into before you get to 12? No, I think I hit all the ones that I was like super passionate about. Um, and, and episode 12, I should say that even as there are parts of this that don't work for me, I do like specifically like the, the way episode 12 kind of wraps things up. I like Dara's part of the arc of, of him, you know, rushing to try to save the day or get the prince to realize what's going on, mostly because Dara has finally realized, I think, who Tamako is. And I specifically love the way the series wraps up, thinking that Dara is going to leave until he falls asleep in a bed of flowers that Mochizo then gives to Tamako as a present, uh, is a really funny ending to the series. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, the episode 12, I just love this finale so much. I mean, you hit on some of, the, like, those big scenes but, you know, the whole finale of the series rests on this thing of where the prince has come in. Choi is sort of like said, hey, like she's a candidate to marry the prince. And everyone is like, oh, my God, like this is such an incredible thing. Um, and But everyone is repeatedly telling Tamako, like, you should do what you think is best. And then, but like by doing that, they're creating a rhetorical distance with her of like they're trying to respect her and her wishes. But by doing that, they're kind of rhetorically pushing her away. Um, and that actually leads to I, I realize the scene is actually in episode 11. One of my favorite scenes with Tomiko 
is in episode 11 as a result of all this and it's uh, Mochizo does it to her over the paper phones and that's the thing that pushes her over the edge and she has this little fit in her room that's the most adorable thing ever where because she has a shared room with Anko she can't raise her voice so she just whispers and quietly stamps her feet as this guy god what's up with everyone like why are you doing this why are you trying to push me away like I'm just gonna round you all up and pound you into Mochi and she's just sort of like quietly stamping her foot and it's the best thing in the world it's such a great piece of character animation and acting and writing and then that leads to the most adorable moment in the show which is Anko saying hey can we sleep in the same bed together for the first time in a while and then when they're cuddling together she says hey can we play koala meaning can you like roll on your back and I'll like cuddle you from behind which is the most adorable thing um, in anime anyways that's episode 11 stuff which sets up in episode 12 that's the position that Tomiko's in is this feeling of everyone's pushing her away and telling her like, Hey, you do what's best. But there's something about the way that you say that, that cuts that whole conversation off. It closes that person off from like advice in conversation in the sense of like trying to respect Tomiko's independence. And then that leads to the, the smallest, but most important thing in the show, which is Deda coming in, finally having a moment with Tomiko. And he just asks her, Hey, what do you think? Like, what do you want to do? And he just asks her that. He asks her opinion. Um, and it's this little moment of sort of of not pushing her way or closing herself off. And I think it's the thing I love about Dead as a character. It, you know, it's the same reason why he's the only person who always calls Anko on. Is like he is the most, like, compassionate and thoughtful person in the show. Um, it's just you don't think of it by looking at him because of the way he, he usually behaves. But deep down, he is really thinking about and cares about and is very kind of fatherly towards all these other people. Um, and him asking that is what prompts Tamako to give this big response that is intercut with the shots of Deta sprinting to go to the prince where he's crying because of how powerful what Tamako said is. But all Tamako is saying is just everything she does every single day in the shopping district. Nothing is important. She doesn't like relate some hugely special episode. She's not even connecting it specifically to the stuff with her mom passing, which kind of sets this up where she sees all the shopping district stores closed and thinks, oh, something awful has happened because the last time all the stores were closed was when my mom died. But she's not using that to fuel this story for Tadella. It's just like, oh, I wake up in the morning and I go outside and I say hi to everybody. And then they give me like a free croquet because we're friends. And then I go to school and I see all my friends there. And then we come back to the shopping district and then we stop by the sh stores and maybe we go to the coffee shop and we get a coffee. And she's just relating her daily life and the thing of like this place and how much she loves it and how much she cares about it. And you start getting that intercut both with Deta running home and then with the different people at the coffee store, including uh, Midori's grandfather, who we didn't talk about, but the guy who runs the toy store and he's doing like a little dance with a Kendama thing and it's fucking amazing. Um, and she's relating all these experiences and all the people she loves and cares about um, as Deta then runs home. He breaks it open, demands that the um, whole thing be called off. Tamako comes in and does the same thing and um, bows her head and says, like, I have to decline. Um, and then Choi reveals that it was all a uh, misunderstanding. But the the simple way in which this sort of daily life and the magic of that daily life is expressed and how on the scales for Tamako, the go become a fantasy princess in like the, in the island nation with talking birds and wake up in the morning and go talk to my buddies and get like some stuff at the shopping district and make mochi that... It's not even a question. There's no word. There's nothing is weighing down the fantasy princess side. There's nothing in that column. Everything is in the shopping district, my community, my family, the things I love and care about. That's the true fantasy. That's the thing that she wants fulfilled. That's the thing she wants to protect. And she can't understand why nobody else is seeing that. Um, and everyone else sort of like, is just like, oh, amazing, a prince, like all this stuff. And she's like, no, none of like none of that is important or valuable. And I think that's just such a powerful conclusion that that puts into perspective all the little tiny pieces and the kind of the vibes and the atmosphere of the show, because it's such a vibes show for most of it. It all comes into sort of stark focus and stark relief in this very dramatically powerful moment. And then the the pin on that is in many ways like the thing that hit me emotionally the most is this little moment at the very end of that where 
all the people are gathered around and the prince is kind of like tells them that he never even really attended that. Like he just came here to get his friends back because he just wants to go home. He wants to go, you know, he's the person like Tomiko. He just wants to have his friends go home and go back to his daily life. Um, he's not really looking for a bride. And then one of the the old woman who runs the croquet shop who has the pink pur or purple hair, she just says Tomiko and kind of pulls Tomiko down and hugs her. And that moment, which this doesn't focus on, it's in a wide shot, and it's just something that happens on the edge, but that moment is the thing that hit me the hardest because you feel so much being communicated in that of them realizing and her, you know, the grandmother specifically realizing, but I think everybody realizing the mistake they had made, what they had done, how that had hurt and offended Tamako, and how much they love and care for her, expressing that one little moment that happens off on the side of a frame. Um, it's, it's a truly phenomenal finale and just like kind of climax to the series. And I agree with that. I, I think it is a beautiful episode. It got me in the feels. I think it expresses that main idea beautifully. I think if anything, listening to you talk about it and thinking about how this episode frames things kind of helps me understand my own problem with criticism with whatever you want to call it of kind of the show's second half is just that. I love that as a conclusion. I do think it maybe takes a little... It, it's, it is a weird thing, though, where there isn't... And I think this is kind of the point, is that there isn't really tension for us about what Tamako will choose. There's nothing in her character that tells us she wants to yeah. go be the princess. So what happens here is a very satisfying payoff because it feels so true to the character. I do think maybe where I lost patience was in the episodes leading up to it, where they're dropping a lot of breadcrumbs about, you know, she is the fated princess, she's got the mole on her neck, what's going to happen here, the prince is coming, she's got the zoom. I thought of it as a zoom date, but it's through the projector on Dara's eyes, which is its own weird kind of thing that's going on there. Um, and so maybe I felt like some of that, it, it was a little bit too much shoe leather to get there, but I do like this ending quite a bit, particularly, again, the very final beat of Dara planning to finally say goodbye. It's Christmas, it's New Year's, he had made his plans, and he's going to leave without saying goodbye because he is graceful and all of these things. But then he gets the flower that is the flower that smells like the prince, and he lays down in a bed of those flowers and is packed up because Mochizo is planning to give those flowers to Tamako. And the end is, is Tamako opening her present and Dara flying out and pecking at her. Uh, and then his eyes projecting uh, Oshimai, the, the the end credit on the stars. This is a great, yeah. great fucking movie. <laughs> yeah, because it's also obviously it's a payoff to the first episode where they have this whole joke in the first episode of t everyone always forgets to give Tamako a birthday present because it's on New Year's and they're all busy and yeah. something happens and prevents it. And so the present they give her inadvertently is Deta, which is amazing. You also do get a great Deta moment near there near the end where he's talking to Mame Dai, the father, um, about like all the things that he's experienced here. And he has this whole thing about how like, hey, coming to this like island, um, like it's, it's, you know, it seems like it should have been very cold, but it was always very warm to me in here. Um, he points to his chest um, and Mame Dai says like, oh, it, it was always like that. And, uh, and then he says, yeah, always, or zut doda, which is what he says in Japanese. And there's just a, such a warmth and ease with which um, the actor says that line, um, that, that Yamazaki Takumi says that line of zut doda, like it was always so warm in here, um, where all the kind of affectations and the preening that uh, Dada does is totally melted away. And the way the character is drawn with his eyes um, sort of like flat and lines um, and this just very this expression of ease and comfort on his face. It's such a great payoff where you feel this sense of these two father figures to Tomiko. Obviously, Dad is kind of like a weird father figure, but that ultimately is what he is. Um, them both kind of connecting over this kind of shared emotional journey they've both been on. Because, of course, I think Mame Dai feels the same way. He just is too uh, much of a hard ass to express it. Um, but it's a, you know... It's one of a million great little moments. I just think this show is so defined by these really well-observed and well-defined characters and this like powerful emotional reality that the show is always exploring, but it's doing it in this way that is kind of a bit more abstract and a bit more kind of atmospheric because it is very much a slice of life show. And it's so much about the vibes and the energy and the movement of these images and the contrast and the framing. 
Um, you know, it's doing it in this very, I think, kind of like artful way of getting at these emotional truths. And I think the way that the last episode puts a pin on all of those things and really kind of defines it and puts it into focus, um, I think it's just masterful. And, and I, yeah, I just really loved the show. Awesome. I'm glad you did. And I, again, I didn't quite wasn't on the level of love. I also hope I didn't come off as too negative at the beginning. There's things that don't work for me in the second half, particularly. I did enjoy watching it. I'm glad we watched it. I like a lot of these characters. I like their world. And it led to a movie that I genuinely adore. Thanks for listening to Japanimation Station. If you're enjoying the show, please remember to like and subscribe, leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, and tell your friends. You can support the show directly on Ko-fi at the link in the description. And remember to check out the Weekly Stuff podcast, our long-running series on movies and video games and everything else on all platforms. And now, back to the show. Yes, because Tomica Love Story, what a fucking movie this is. Holy shit. Kiwani needs to make more movies. I mean, I know they've made quite a few movies and we're going to see several more, <laughs> but it's like, you know, they're so good at making TV shows, but it's not always true that a director that's good at a TV show or a studio that's really good at TV stuff is also good at making movies. Um, but goddamn, Kiwani, every movie so far has been an absolute 10 out of 10 home run. Um, and that is true of Tomica Love Story as well. Uh, let's do a little bit of the background specifically for the movie and get into it. Um, so Tomica Love Story, the they announced the film officially in December 2013. So the show had been over for a while at that point, for about six months at that point. Um, it was announced with the tagline, Tomiko Muke Mashita, or like Tomiko turns to face it. It's an incredibly hard thing to translate, but it's just a sense of like Tomiko is going to have to face reality or something is kind of what it is. Um, and it has this sort of um, image of a very like kind of K-Own ending-esque image with Tamako that looks a little bit older. She has her hair down and she's on this background with flowers. It's kind of how they introduced the, announced the show, giving the sense of like, they immediately set it up as like, it's totally a little bit different than what the show is going to be. Um, the film then released on April 26, 2014, with an initial release of 24 theaters. So at a small release, this is for context, the same number that Disappearance of Suzumiya Harihi had in terms of theaters, but it's much smaller than K on the movie, if you remember, which released totally wide with 137 theaters. So we're talking about another small scale release like Disappearance. Um, despite opening with that very low screen count, Tomiko Love Story was the 11th highest grossing movie its opening weekend, um, which the number one movie, I thought this was very fascinating, not really relevant to the Tomiko Love Story that much, but the number one movie of that weekend was Frozen, which had come out a month earlier, but this was the beginning of Golden Week, and so Frozen jumped back up to the top <laughs> of the box office. You know, just for like context of how well that fucking movie did. Um, and also this opened the same week as a movie of the polar opposite level of quality of Tomica Love Story, Amazing Spider-Man 2, an absolutely dreadful film, which unfortunately ranked fourth in the box office. Um, although I, I wonder if you did the math. I wonder if that because that did way worse than Amazing Spider-Man 1 did. I wonder how the math would work out relative to the theater count, um, which one did better in that sense. Um, over time, the movie expanded its theater count uh, steadily, and it ultimately made over 2 billion yen, which is about 15 million US dollars. But for a th release of this size, that is really good. For reference, That's, disappearance was... Yeah. Sorry, I was just going to say, this is 2014. Okay, so it's one year later. Yeah. Dragon Ball Z Battle of Gods 2013, the big comeback for Dragon Ball, 3 billion yen. This is two thirds yeah. of that. That's fucking insane. Yes. And so for reference, Disappearance of Suzumiya Harihi made at 840 million yen. So Disappearance didn't even make a billion in the box office. And Disappearance of Suzumiya Harihi, if you remember, that at the time was considered a crazy massive breakout outlier success for a late night anime movie that like yes. nothing else was even close to that. So this is what I mean with like Tomiko Market is kind of a weird thing where the show did not sell a lot in terms of the Blu-ray, but it cultivated this really passionate audience and it got like the movie really paid off with that because it made a lot of money for that kind of release. Um, and it also reviewed extremely well. Um, it was very beloved. It ranked number one on the PIA audience satisfaction survey for the week, which is similar to like what CinemaScore is over here. So the people who watched it very much enjoyed it. 
the movie and Yamada Naoko as the director won a newcomer award at the 2014 Agency of Cultural Affairs Art Festival, which is like an official Japanese government run thing that usually gives that to like more art housey kind of movies and stuff like that. Um, the movie Sean, was also this is yeah. a super art housey movie. I just want yes. to say this is the sure. most art housey thing we've seen from KyoAni, other than maybe Endless Eight. Like this is an art house ass movie. Yes. This is like if uh, anyway we can get into it later. It's art housey. <laughs> yes, no, it, you're you're understanding right, and I think that's why the Cultural Affairs Bureau said, "Hey, we should uh, give this movie a reward." Because I had a whole interview that I read with Tomiko Naoko where she was like talking about this reward and she said like yeah when we were making the mo the movie we did have a stop and thought like do you think we could maybe win the agency of cultural affairs thing and like the sense of that was partially like both like i think we're making a really good movie but also the kind of movie we're making is sort of leaning in that direction yes. <laughs> um the movie also screened with the short film uh, minami no shima no derechan or derechan of the southern island which if you watch that on the blu-ray they have that separated out as a special feature which i think is wrong you should, it's it it is so clearly designed to be watched at the beginning of the film. There are like callbacks to that in the movie. You have to watch the Derechan of the Southern Island. Um, it, well, also it's less of its own standalone short than a recap of the series with some yeah. like because it's got a bunch of it's got a big flashback in the middle. It's Derechan like he resp he recites the plot of the show and it yeah. is about him back on his Southern Island and he's he's got. Choi and the prince making mochi for him and so it is less kind of its own standalone it's not like a looney tune short with derechan or something which is what i kind of yeah. expected it to be it is funny and it is nice but it is more like here's our little for those who watch the show or for those who are being brought with their friends and didn't see the show here's a little intro amuse bouche of what tomiko market was before we get into what the movie is Yes, but it does set up the butt mochi and the boob mochi joke. And it's yes, like, yes. those jokes, I just don't think land the same way if you don't have uh, Dara set them up at the beginning. Um, because the, the inverse of that Dara is doing it innocently, and it's just yes. a misunderstanding. But Tamako is the fucking perv with her mochi. Yes. That is the funniest thing in this entire series. Yes, like the fact that he's just, Dana just wants to make a peach mochi and he wants to make yes. a mochi that looks like him. That happens to, if you look at it from the back, it looks like his like feather at the top is a nipple. Whereas, no, Tomiko is the one who's like leering at women at the bathhouse trying to be like, <laughs> like, how soft should I make it if I want to make boob mochi? <laughs> it's, like, yes. it's so good. Uh, anyways, no, I agree. That, the Blu-ray, it should just be an 85 minute feature. The 80 move, yes. minute movie, five minute short. It should just be in one file. 100%. Um, anyways, the short was directed by Ishihara Tatsuya. Um, so, you know, there's that uh, little nugget for you. And then, um, so yes, and so the other thing with the movie, so this is kind of like where once the movie hits, I think it becomes clear that Tomika Market is like this big cult hit. And so when I see people online nowadays, when you have these conversations around the anime and people are like, oh, what was successful, what was not? And people go and look back at the Blu-ray figures, which is the thing that people use to define these conversations, you will see a lot of people in, in the English language sphere in particular talk about Tomiko Market like it was a failure. And that's just, I think, absolutely the wrong way to frame the show. Similar to Nietzsche Joe, where you're missing a lot of the context of the other avenues in which it was received. And that first week sales for the limited release Blu-ray is not the end all be all of understanding a show's reception. And case in point, last year, KyoAni held a 10th anniversary event at the Shinjuku Piccadilly Theater in June for several weeks um, with screenings that showed the show and screenings that showed the movie, um, including like some special screenings with the cast members there um, and stuff like that, giving like interviews and all that kind of stuff. Um, and there was even a Tomiko Night event where they showed in one screening the entire TV show and the movie, just back to back, um, which were like a one night special, which that would have been... Maybe too much. I don't even know if I could do that. Like, I love Tomical Market, but it's not a binge kind of show. But man, that would be a, a pretty cool experience to just go for like the 10th anniversary event because you know everyone else there is going to be crazy huge fans. But the fact that this show, which only is a one core season of TV and a single movie that came out a year later, to get like this kind of 10th anniversary event. And, you know, that was not a, just a one night thing. It lasted for like a couple of weeks at different theaters and stuff. Like, that tells you the kind of cult hit status that this has. Um, and it was, like, huge and big and advertised, and they made all kinds of big merchandising for it and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so it, it's it's a cool thing, and I think it indicates 
that Tomoko market. It's a weird show. It's not, I think, a kind of like popular show in the sense that it's like like K-On is, where I would recommend it to absolutely anybody. But if you're like a, a connoisseur of the slice of life genre of anime, like Tomoko Market is just like one of the most fascinating examples of a slice of life thing. And then you get Tomoko Love Story, which is like one of my favorite love story like movies I've ever seen. Like I think this movie and the way it sort of expresses this story of this love between these two characters and narrowing it very specifically on the story of um, Mochizo confessing to Tamako his feelings, getting the fallout of that, and Tamako having to sort of grapple with what that all means, and then ending it with her confessing back. Like, it's such a, like, sort of very focused and super defined love story told between these two characters. But it is so tremendously effective. I think it is like a perfectly paced film, a perfectly structured film. It is so gorgeous, incredibly beautifully directed um, with incredible voice acting and music and everything. Like, I just loved this movie to death. I I did too. This is where we are in 100% agreement. I think the movie is 10 out of 10, just phenomenal. It's, and I think part of it is what you were just saying. It is focused in such a beautiful way it is a relatively short movie but it is still a movie it's 80 minutes that's a lot of time to fill right and it has two things that need to happen in it he has to confess to her and then she has to confess to him that's the two poles that the movie is operating on and it is entirely about the build-up to the first confession the fallout from that confession, and the build-up to the second confession. And there are other things going on in terms of the world is still very rich, Tamako's friends are still around, and Midori in particular has her own kind of arc going on in the background. But it is about these two characters. It is about that idea. You could tell this story in a 22-episode or 22 minute episode of television. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You could, and do it at the act break is where the first confession happens and then build up to the second one. You could do that. But this movie stretches its legs and lets moments breathe. And it is about, it is less about any kind of plot or, you know, story momentum or any of that. It is about living with the feelings these characters have, where I think Mochizo is very much our protagonist of kind of the first act of the movie, seeing the world through his eyes and his character conflict of when, how, and if he will confess to Tamako and understanding the emotional atmosphere that leads him to do it the way he does in the moment he does. And then it is about living with Tamako as her world is kind of shaken by something she knew but didn't know and then how she responds to that And it is the kind of thing Kyoto Animation is the best at. And it's something that Yamada Naoko is supremely good at. And I think the thing about this movie is it is one of the most unmitigated masterpieces of storyboarding I have ever seen. And Mm -hmm. and it is entirely storyboarded by by Yamada Naoko. Um, This is not one where they... Understandably, some of their other movies that are longer are split up into multiple people. This one is all her directing and storyboarding. And there is, I think, a really clear authorial hand. In the same way you'll get from, you know, a Hayao Miyazaki or a um, a Makoto Shinkai or a Mamoru Hosoda or something like that, right? People who storyboard their own movies all together. Um, And it is just... Uh, like shot to shot, moment to moment, every framing choice, every cut, the way things move in terms of pace, uh, it's beautiful. The scene where Mochizo confesses and they are at the riverbank and there's those Mm -hmm. steps they used to play on and it ends with her falling in the water. That whole sequence is like a contender for one of the best scenes we've watched from Kyoto Animation. It's an app absolute masterpiece but scenes like that are just everywhere in this thing and this is also i think outside of maybe some of the suzumiya haruhi stuff the best use of the we're pretending we're shooting this with a real camera thing we've seen Mm -hmm. from kyoto animation it's really intense in this one and this is one where like the photography department in particular just deserves a lot of praise for realizing what yamada naoko is asking them to do which is a lot of like handheld photography in this one it's not necessarily handheld photography where the camera is moving around with the characters through spaces it's not doing that 
that's more kind of like what Hyoka did in the episode with the murder mystery where we see the amateur video. This is more that as we're observing the characters, there's a little bit of camera wobble. There's often a little bit of like fringing on the frames on the sides of the image. There's focus effects going on. And there's just this sense that the world is a little unsteady for a lot of this movie. And there's a lot of effects with that that I think is like viscerally effective in making you feel the emotions of these characters. Um, and living that life with them and reflecting on moments that are similar in your own life. Uh, it is a tremendously put together film. Yeah, it's it's incredible. And just like the amount that's communicated through the visuals and that visual language. Because yes, you're right. Like that, that sense of the kind of like the handheld camera feel and the kind of unsteady nature of the world these characters are in because you're on this threshold of, of them moving into adulthood where all the things that kind of have defined where they came from is starting to crumble around them as Mochizo is making the choice to to go to Tokyo to pursue his passion for um, filmmaking and all that stuff. And then also that, that goes hand in hand with, I think, the choice of saying, let's take the data stuff in the fantasy world out of it because we are doing kind of, you know, the classic thing you do of where you know, fantasy represents kind of childhood and you're like leaving those things behind as you move into adulthood. So you're kind of anchor. The thing that made you feel safe in the Tomiko market in many ways was Dena because he is this insane, weird sort of super character who exists in a kind of almost a different plane than the show. You know, that kind of Greek chorus, kind of Shakespearean of soliloquy, turn to the stage and talk to the audience kind of thing. That comfort of that kind of hand is gone and your kind of comic relief is kind of gone. You know, this still is a funny movie that has a lot of really good jokes, but you but they're much more kind of centered human jokes and less of like the cartoon antics you got in the TV show. And all that goes hand in hand with the stylistic shift that this does with this much more um, kind of grounded, kind of gritty um, look that the movie has in lots the of The color places. palette is more muted. It's a yes. little darker. Tomiko's hair is colored like black in this one. Yes. Where I don't think we're meant to think like her hair has changed, but it is in the in the show, there's a little more blue in it. It's like a just a slightly lighter shade of black. It is like stark black here. And again, it's not like she went and dyed her hair. It is that the world is just cast in a little bit more of an earthy tone. It's still an incredibly colorful movie, but it is a little earthier and grittier. Yeah, and it's just like you have lots of scenes with really like harsh, stark shadows. There's like lots of scenes that are set at like evening and things like that. So you have like some of the classroom scenes where you have these like very big dramatic shadows that cut across the whole frame. Lots of characters, you know, sitting outside at night, like staring up at the stars. Um, you know, that like whole kind of tone. It feels like this is a movie that's set primarily at evening and primarily at dawn. And like those are the two times of day that you're mostly spending um, your time in. And it just gives it this very different, very kind of raw emotional feel that I think kind of puts you as the audience like off your game a little bit, um, especially if you're coming straight from the TV show and you're expecting a certain thing. Like this show kind of like throws you for a loop in a really good way and kind of um, makes you kind of reassess a lot of things as Tamako, our sort of main character, has to reassess everything in her life. Because I think one of the things that's fascinating about this movie is the is the choice to do this movie what it is. Tamako love story. It's Tamako can feel like realizing she loves this boy and confessing her love for him. Where Tamako is the kind of character that doesn't fall in love, right? In the same way that like Yui and Kaon doesn't fall in love, right? Like you just don't kind of take this sort of character type in anime and you don't bring them to this place. And this one thing where in a bunch of different interviews that I found, um, like a consistent thing that Yamada Naoko talked about in terms of like the movie and the kind of like impetus behind the movie was this repeated thing that was kind of like the mission statement, which is telling a love story where the kind of girl like Tamako falls in love. Because of course, Tamako is like a lot of girls in real life, but anime... And like the anime business specifically, I don't think is particularly comfortable with taking a character like that and telling this kind of love story with her because it pushes her outside of the kind of um, comfort zone of your slice of life thing. Like, like as soon as love in like an actual relationship enters your sort of like abstract moe life slice of life show, it cuts off a whole kind of audience member 
that's kind of a very toxic audience member, but it's one of the types of audiences that support these shows that sort of live vicariously through this idea of like, oh, I'm like Yui's in love with me or I'm in love with Yui, right? Like I'm here in this show. These girls like like how like pop idols in the like music industry in Japan, you do not want people to know that you have a boyfriend, even though most of them almost certainly do have boyfriends or have been in or are in romantic relationships. You don't let that be publicly known because it cuts off a certain kind of fan that imagines themselves in that position. Um, and so I think there's a kind of boldness in that kind of business sense that saying like, let's take this character that's the kind of character that's designed in the TV show often not to have a love story and make a whole love story. Not just like, let's make a love story. Let's make the best, best damn fucking love story you have ever seen in a movie. Um, and I think all of these different kind of aesthetic choices go hand in hand with that idea of like, we have to change the way that we look at Tamako and take her off of that pedestal a little bit and bring her back down to this even more human level than she was on the TV show. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I think I would even, I agree with everything you're saying, but I might frame it slightly differently. Like it is the best damn love story you've seen in terms of just how good the movie is and how much it makes you feel things. But I actually don't think it's aspiration is to be sweeping and swooning in that sure. kind of sense. Yeah. It is so small and intimate. It is not about the next day. It is not about being in a relationship. It is about contemplating, taking the step from being a child where you have friends to being an adult where you have more complicated, fraught, possibly, you know, sexual, possibly romantic, but all, in all of those things, vulnerable relationships and being brave enough to take that step. And that is specifically what the movie wants to be about. And it's very good about kind of zoning out and saying all of those other things are not in our field of vision. This movie mm -hmm. is about one aspect of a love story and it is about that moment where you make yourself vulnerable enough to have love. You know, Tamako and uh, Mochizo could fall apart as a couple one week after this and the movie's events are not any less valid because it's not really about them becoming a couple it is about them taking that step to be vulnerable both individually at which point a coupling is possible and i think one of the things that just made me want to stand up and cheer with this movie is the moment when it cuts to black in uh -huh. that you know i had not been keeping my eye on the time and I'm thinking the movie's clearly leading to an ending, but I don't know exactly how it's going to end. For all I know, it does, you know, a montage that shows them 10 years in the future with kids and they've combined their mochi shops or whatever. I didn't really think it was going to do that, but it could. Um, but instead it is, she gets there, she tosses the, the cups to him, and then he tosses the one across to her. He's a little confused at what she's doing, but it makes sense to her. And then as she, like, gets ready to yell into the little cup phone, we cut to black, she says the last word, Cue the music, cue the title, and then one last little bit of animation. And like that is such a clear signal of what this movie is about. That the moment of resolution is the moment of the confession because it's the moment when she is brave enough to be vulnerable in the same way he was and they've met as equals. And I think the movie is just so brilliantly smart about that. And it's what all of that great photography and animation and storyboarding is doing throughout the other 79 minutes of the film is about putting you in that state of someone considering the vulnerability that goes along with taking those steps into adult relationships. Um, and I think it is so smart about that, uh, just consistently. And it's smart in a way that like, if you have not seen the show, 100% you could watch this movie and enjoy it. It works. It doesn't. It gives you everything you need to know. The couple of, there's like two mentions of Dara and that might confuse you. But other than that, you're fine. But if you've seen the show, it does have this extra layer of re re uh, relevance where you know what childhood was kind of coded as. You know, having seen Tamako as kind of a static character who is happy with her life. But then you also know what the vulnerability that she opens up to here means and what she is maybe, you know, emotionally risking is that basis that we got in the TV show. And I think the movie works either way beautifully. Yeah, but it definitely is like a very powerful contrast with the show, which ends with this like affirmation of the status quo and how important the status quo is. And so then immediately turning around to the movie and then saying, 
But of course, that status quo eventually will have to change because time moves on. These people get older. Um, and I think that's like it's such a powerful way to sort of transition into this different phase to give this movie this whole different kind of tone and style to reflect that and reflect what needs to happen to the character where Tamako can still have her love for the shopping district. And I think that, you know, whatever happens after the credits, she's going to stay in that dot stop shopping district. She's going to inherit that mochi store like fucking hell on earth would not stop that from happening for Tamako. Um, but she could potentially still be she could do that with mochi, right? She could do that or mochi. So she could do that with um, having a relationship. She could pursue those other things. But but that would mean a change in the way she views herself and her relationship with this person who's been in her life her entire life. Um, which the show puts kind of, or the movie puts a fine point on that they have always grown up across each other. They are like the son and daughter of these two different mochi stores, you know, all this stuff. Um, but yeah, it, it focusing in on, you say, is that like moment of accepting that vulnerability and opening yourself up to that um, is about taking that step into adulthood that Tamako needs to take. And uh, you just get such a strong, confident sense of vision from the movie that top to down, like every different element of it is so intentionally designed to reflect those different choices to tell this very specific narrow story about these two people. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it just, you know, it's, it's kind of a tour de force, like yes. in its own, it's a very quiet movie. It's a very soft movie, but like in its own way, I think it sweeps you up and it so consumes you in this kind of emotional state that the characters are in and in the tension of that and what it means, um, you know, it is building on it. it. One thing it inherits from the show that just makes it work all the better is just how lived in that world is. That you have a million characters in the shopping district you can cut to to make this feel like a world these characters exist in. Even if the movie's focus is quite a bit narrower than the show's. The fact that it exists in such a rich atmosphere and world makes all those things we're talking about work even better for the movie. And again, I think even if you hadn't seen the show, I think that would be true in this movie. That sense that it is set in a very real place. Absolutely. Um... Yeah. So I think let's like start running through some of the movie and kind of breaking down some of like the big scenes and moments and stuff. Um, Cause there's a bunch of different like motifs and stuff and things that recur throughout the film. I love one of them um, being that you get right near the beginning, which is um, like filmmaking and home videos, which represent the past. Right. And this is a thing that KyoAni has gotten really fucking good at, you know, ever yes. since we had episode one of Harihi, where you have the whole, you know, the home movie like thing that they do with uh, Mikudu, they've gotten very, very good at finding ways of replicating the aesthetic of older versions of like film and doing all that. And so you get this great montage at the beginning narrated by Mochizo that the, f the footage you're seeing is like represented like they're these old home movies of the two families with their two kids being raised together. Um, you get, I like the consistency of the different phases of the childhood you see that you get back to every once in a while. And my favorite one being what looks like kind of young elementary school where Mochizo is constantly tugging on her pigtails, which is like yes. the most adorable <laughs> and also most realistic thing in the world. Um, and so I, I love the way that they tie in Mochizo's, um, his film club stuff and his love of filmmaking with the way that the past is represented, which of course also connects with the show to the big standout stuff in episode nine, where you get the, the VHS tape from the dad playing the song to the mom and all of that. So there's the sense of these home movies kind of connect these people to their past. Yes, it is. You know, there's, uh, there's an idea that I refute in my dissertation. There's a section early on where I'm just kind of laying out some of like my theoretical priors. And one of mine is animation is not a cameraless medium. And this is an argument that is sometimes made in animation theory that I viscerally disagree with, which is the idea that, um, you know, even when animation does have a camera, it's incidental, blah, blah, blah. The camera is in no way incidental to animation. And in fact, like, I think when you look at a lot of animators, including, and Kyoto Animation just happens to be a really good example of this because they come back to this style over and over again. The idea of a camera, even though on a literal level, yes, there actually is not a camera involved in the production of this show. It's a digitally, you know, you're scanning things into the computer or drawing into the computer and then compositing them. But the idea of a camera is so important to them mm -hmm. about where they place 
and frame every image. And then like what a camera can do for people in the world is also like something they think about a lot. And it's, you know, we have seen that theme more heavily in other pieces of work, but it is here as well, including that first scene um, with Mochizo in his club where he is editing their weird panda video that we never get <laughs> context for, which I just fucking love. And uh, there's also just pangs of nostalgia for me looking at the editing software he's using, which I uh -huh. think is meant to be either like Windows Movie Maker or maybe an old version of iMovie or something, but it's the kind of thing I used back when you and I were in high school making our silly videos, yeah. and I was just like, oh man, that takes me back. That kind of stuff never worked. I bet yeah. he's really frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I do like his. He does have. He has like an old Mac. Um, because yes. you see some like the like their like fake Mac um interface in uh the scene where he's he's considering deleting his uh yes. videos of Tomiko and stuff. But yes, I do love all of that in the way that they, you know, it's just there. There is something as you know, people who made weird fucking videos at our debate tournaments, um, yes. where someone saw a random clip of it. It would not, you know, we didn't have a big panda costume, but it was not any more particularly like grounded or reasonable. We had lightsabers and shit like yes. that. So yeah, we had some. Yeah, it was not any more grounded when that they're doing. And I do love the 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 movie never attempts to tell you what's going on. <laughs> yes, because it's, it's not important. Um, no. Uh, yeah. So that that step is great. Um, you also have in the opening, uh, I love they have like a random sort of American sitcom style. All the characters turn to camera and it pauses and their names <laughs> pop up, um, which is great. I like that the, the title of the movie shows up three different times in the film. Because at the yes. very beginning, you have this gorgeous little sequence where you have an apple on the desk that Mochizo's at. And you have this great camera move that pulls out from him where he's looking at their his that it pulls all the way out to see uh, the two dads fighting in the street which is a gets up to go stomp them and knocks the apple over which falls on the ground it stops and then you get your very art housey looking opening title thing where yes. it's like it just says Tomica love story in a very simple font with the apple there and then you get all the the flashback stuff with the home movies narrated by Mochizo. That then transitions into your big like anime style opening with your the song, um, and you have your anime style like logo treatment, and then you have everyone turn to camera, and then at the very end of the movie they put the title up again. So you you if you did not if you forgot at some point that you're watching Tomic and Love Story, then don't worry, they will remind you a couple of times um, that that's what the movie is. Um, you could but, absolutely take this opening theme song, which in the movie is set to the, um, it's literally called Love Song uh, yes. in Japanese, um, Koi no Uta, but it is the song that Mamadai has in episode nine. It's the same, and yes. in the opening, it's the same recording from the show. They do a cover of it with um, Tamako's voice actress in the, in the end credits. It's lovely. But here, you could absolutely, Sean, take that scene and just put the full house theme on there everywhere you look, <laughs> and it would fit. All of them turning to camera and having their names. Maybe I should make that as a bonus for our channel and just have that because it absolutely feels like that. Yeah, and, and it is phenomenal because you also have for all of the girls, um, you have a different like thing, like the line that pops up is a little bit different. So like for Anko, the line under her name ends in the fossil, the ammonite fossil yes. that she got from the boy. Um, Midori has a, the one of the batons, My, but the best is Kana has a little hammer because she's yeah. also holding a little hammer because she's fixing the locker, the eternally broken locker in the back of the classroom that she is always fixing, um, which yeah. is phenomenal. You also have this Mochizo incredible... Mochizo also has one. His is the, oh, yes. it's the cup phone. So his is yes. there too. Yeah. Yes, that's true. Well, because, yeah, because Tamako and Mochizo both have the cup phone because, yes. of course, that's they're connected. You also have this amazing little piece of sort of like faux paper craft animation that obviously this is like this is not a different literal style of animation. They're, they're animating it the same way they're animating everything. Like it's not actual paper craft, but they are drawing 2D images like it is someone doing stop motion paper craft animation yes. of the cut of cutouts of Mame Dai and the mom um, meeting each other and it turning into a heart, um, which is phenomenal. Um, I just love that. Like there's a lot of like cool little experimental things like that in there. Um, which also surprised me because then at the end of that, you have that ends on a shot of Tamako and Mochizo sitting at their desks next to each other in the classroom. A shot that is then reused later in the movie at about the two thirds point after they're in this very awkward space for this absolutely incredible 
um, time lapse sequence of the two yes. of them sitting there in an entire classroom day going by in like a minute or whatever, which is the other most art housey thing in the film to me. <laughs> of like that, but the whole like, movie. This yeah. is like this. There's like there's a very Richard Linklater quality to some of this in uh-huh. terms of just kind of the kind of slow brooding nature of the romance unfolding. But there's, I mean, you could go with a bunch of art house references. This absolutely feels like something you would go see at like the kind of indie theater in downtown or something. Like it, it, it has that quality in spades, and it's very, very good at it. Yes, um, but I like you have just all these like very interesting pieces of animation to reflect different styles of things that you would do in live action, like paper craft or like doing a time lapse, which of course you would actually, like it's not actually, well, maybe it is actually a time lapse. I don't know how they, if you, I guess if you think about how they did it, it's it's still in some ways a time lapse, just in a different sort of way. You're not shooting. You could argue footage. all animation is a time lapse because exactly. it's just still images and it's decide, it's how little or more, more movement there is determines that. But yes, it is, uh, yeah. time lapse is definitely probably easier to do in animation than in live action in some ways yes because it yeah because you don't have to (laughs) you don't have to have two real people sit nearly motionless in those desks for hours on end but yes um so you have all that stuff just an absolute like amazing opening to get you kind of into the whole tone of this movie in the style um which leads into you do get uh, just an absolutely gorgeous scene in the record store. I'm just looking at my screenshots, um, and I just love just just seeing that record store set um, with the movie budget is yes, it's it's very good looking. Um, absolutely. So yeah, it's just scrolling through. So then I think the next really big scene is you get the the confession scene because you said earlier that this is like one of those, you know, this is this is on like the Mount Rushmore of QAnon scenes yes. um we have had like this definitely like goes up there next to like um the kyon stomping on his head his own head and disappearance of Suzumi Ahadahi. um like this is the, in that kind of like all-time greats uh so what's some of the stuff jonathan that really stands out to you about what makes the scene so good i mean it's just this this movie and you know this is true of a lot of kyoani stuff it is very good at picking spaces and rigorously developing them over the course of a scene or a whole series, you know, like Mm -hmm. every club room set is, is like that. But this movie is very good at like picking a setting and making it the focal point of a scene and like showing you the geography of it and then really exploring it in a way that also explores kind of the hearts and minds of the characters. Um, if I want to break out, if we're going to be art house and artsy, then I'll break it out the word and I'll just say liminal. There's a lot of like <laughs> spaces here that feel very liminal where they are on this. I mean, they are literally on a little, you know, beachhead opening up to the river. So they are on a boundary. They are overlooking something, right? But there is this kind of, you know, partial bridge of stones leading out to it that they go through. And so it is representative of, I think, their whole relationship at this point. But it is also this space from their childhood where they used to play from, it seems like, the phase where he was, like, uh, kind of playfully bullying her as elementary school kids and shoving her in the water. Um, And so the way that space both collapses childhood and adulthood and collapses that idea of being kind of on the brink of something. Uh, And then the scene just goes through and uses that space in so many creative ways. There are shots of them reflected in the water. There are lots of long shots just showing them within the space. There's a bunch of amazing, you know, close-ups of the two of them. Um, Like there's there's, uh, one thing that they do a lot in this film is they'll do these mirrored compositions that cut between the two. So like there's, you know, a moment in this sequence later on where you have their backs to each other and that's shown in one shot of her on the far right of the frame with the frame mostly empty and then him on the far left with the frame mostly empty. And if you put those two images next to each other in your screenshot gallery, it looks like one kind of widescreen image, but it's separate. Mm -hmm. They also do that in the classroom scene later on. Um, and I just think, you know, over and over again, the, the visual language of it is really beautiful and really smart. And this is just kind of on the level of storyboarding. When you then add in the animation and the color work, which is just ludicrously gorgeous, it is so nuanced. The kind of sunset hues that you're getting everywhere that go from kind of golden to pink as he confesses his love. Um, you know, the way they hold on individual close-ups once that happens, like him gripping her arm uh, and all of that. It's it's tremendous. It's powerful. You feel how he does not go into that scene 
planning the words he says but at a certain point they come out in a way that feels inevitable because they have to and the visual language and the animation builds us to that moment so beautifully I, you could break this scene down and teach it in I feel like a film studies class of kind of any level from like freshman to mm -hmm. graduate study to break down what it is doing as a piece of narrative filmmaking um, and you could watch it on mute and you would get 90% of what it's doing yeah, because there's so much here. Like one thing of uh, that you point out that I love so much about the scene is the color palette as it shifts because it starts in this sort of like late afternoon kind of like slightly golden color palette that then just slowly turns orange as it sort of ramps up. And then at the moment of the confession is when it turns pink. Um, and it's like, you know, it's so good at both feeling very naturalistic because it never feels like, oh, the color is like excessively stylized in order to express that internal feeling. But they have picked the exact right time of day and shown this transition. You know, as I said earlier, like every big moment of this movie is either at dawn or it's at dusk and like evening in that shift. Um, another thing, if we want to do our liminal word, right? That's another, let's a liminal time in the day of this movement between the day and the night. Um, and the way that that reflects the emotions of the characters, um, it's just so gorgeous. I also think that, you know, this whole movie, especially all the stuff between Mochizo and Tamago in particular, is such a good uh, sort of case study of interesting ways to do blocking and movement of characters in the frame and in the scene, in the geography, in order to communicate, like, the distance between them. Um, and things like you have them sitting on the steps before they go out onto the stepping stones. And there's like this huge space, it feels like, between them because they're both put into the opposite ends of their respective frames. And then when you see them together in the same frame, there is like a line that divides them made up of the, um, the blocks in the steps that they're sitting on. Uh, and it feels like, you know, Mochizo is trying to like break through this wall of this gap between them so he goes out onto those stones and i love the moment where they get very close to each other when they do that um he has like kind of walked out she goes past him turns around and comes back puts the this stone that looks like a mochi out to him and then has this brief flash to her mom because she's talking about like what she loves about mochi um, because right, she keeps on on the scene going on and on about all these things where she's kind of distracted about what's going on with her club and she's been thinking about things connected to her, her mom. And so she's on like her own track and Mochizo can't kind of derail her and pull her attention to what he is doing. And she has that memory of the Mochi talking to her after losing her mom. But at this point, she doesn't realize that that was Mochizo. And I think that that sort of like that gap in the memory starts to reconstruct this like kind of wall between them um, that she then starts to walk back. He then turns and forcibly grabs her and pulls her arm to pull her into his space and to keep her there. Um, so he can tell her that he loves her, which then of course causes her to like fall down and kind of like break the whole style of blocking you've had. Uh, throughout this whole scene where she falls into the water you have this just amazing shot of her under the water stunned and so you get the you know the way that they draw her kind of refracted weirdly through the water and bubbles coming out of her mouth to kind of create the surface of the water is so smart because you've definitely seen um shots where you like see a character through water and they've had to draw them in a specific way to take the refraction of light into account but having the bubbles come surface so you create a plane on the top of the image where you know where the water is just like it's a, such a great way of bringing real depth to the imagery and then you see from her perspective up out looking at mochizo um and it's just that sense of like the gap and the push and pull between these two characters as they're trying to overcome these boundaries. They're trying to communicate this thing. Once that thing is communicated, it like destroys that boundary and creates kind of like a new one. And then she kind of collapses and runs away. And there's this very fun Looney Tune sequence of her getting up and walking away. And then she starts walking a little bit faster. And then eventually her legs turn into blurs and she zooms across and like disappears into the distance. And he's just left there with a very sad shot of him just standing alone in the um, in the river with the bags off to the side. Um, but yeah, it's just that sense of the movement of these characters in the frame and, and the relationship dynamic that's being expressed about all through all that. It's so powerful. It's so potent. It just tugs at the heartstrings. 
so much and as you say you don't even need the sound like you don't even need the dialogue like you can it's expressed purely through the movement of these two people in the space together and here's where again you know let's collapse the space between animation and live action if you are someone who wants to direct movies and you're not an animator you just want to direct live action movies you could learn as much from this scene in this movie about blocking as you would from any live action movie that's ever been oh, made. Oh yeah. Because everything you're doing on that level of like shot choice and blocking is could 100% be done in live action. The like challenges of this scene in live action would more be on lighting more than anything frankly would be mm-hmm. getting this in the right time of day for the lights and the colors which means you would only have a short time to film it and with the amount of camera setups here it would take an ungodly amount of time to film. That's where it becomes like animation can do this a lot easier. Um, easier is the wrong word but more readily. You know it still takes a lot of effort. Uh, but in terms of the actual like blocking of the characters where are they in the shot? Where is the camera in relation to them how is the story told from shot to shot in that style um boy there's a lot to learn here and it is really masterfully done and it uh it's it's very bespoke throughout it does not simply rely on kind of a shot reverse shot there is because this is a scene of a dynamic between the two of them in flow it really matters that that dynamic is not particularly stable at any point mm-hmm. in terms of what shots we have. Are we reversing to similar cuts? There's a lot of changes and there's a lot of movement, even though that movement in terms of their actual distance in the geography of the space is fairly minimal. It's out a couple of steps into that little bridge and then it back a little bit. Um, but the, the, the amount of movement that the camera makes in relation with them shot to shot uh, is stunning. Absolutely. Yeah, amazing. And then you get this really... Yeah. amazing sequence that reminds you you're in animation um where she's running home and like the the kind of lights start to blur out and turn into these kind of blurred lights that then transition to this beautiful kind of like watercolor dreamscape that she is running through home um that it's almost like you know she's having like a new type flash or some shit you know like it is this like really beautiful abstract imagery where her whole world kind of just turns into colors and impressions um as she is like sprinting through the shopping district and you hear like lines from the different people in the shopping district like go like oh tomiko tomiko hey what's wrong but she doesn't even hear them because she's just traveling through this space desperate to like get home um to try to process what has just happened Yes, I love this moment. It's, I mean, it's very different for anything in Tomiko Love Story. We have yeah. not seen interiority depicted like this. You know, there's other anime that do it. We can make the new type joke. You know, KyoAni has done it in different ways. But uh, it has not done this kind of complete diegetic break before. Uh, and it's it's powerful. I mean, I might even have to go back and add a sentence or two on this into the chapter of my dissertation that's about sort of how anime sometimes, you know, weaponizes handcraft as a real tool of storytelling. And this is one where it's not just watercolor, but I mean, it's it's real watercolors on paper yes. where you can see the splashes and you can see the unevenness of it. Uh, and you're really meant that it's, it's a world of like paper craft color that she is running through for a moment. Uh, and it expresses that completely abstractly, but very beautifully. Yeah, it's totally gorgeous. Um... So then you get a bunch of uh, scenes of them moping at home that are very good, um, very sad. <laughs> this is where I, one thing I forgot to mention, and it's it's in Tomiko Market. You also get it very prominently here. One detail of Mochizo's room I adore. He's got a little toy train, train. set yes, that runs under true. his desk. And there's so many great shots, both in the movie and the show. There's one great shot in one of the episodes of the show where they play with scale of where it like starts, it cuts into a close up of the train that you don't realize is a toy train yet. And then like it zooms out and dead is standing next to it. Um, and so you realize it's a little toy train. Lots of great things like that. That's just one of those details. That's a real Kyoani touch where they've really thought through this space and like tried to make it a real place where this person has lived in this weird kind of, odd thing of him having this toy train is just phenomenal um, oh mochizo's room is such a great set and like yeah. the and that he is and and i think tamako's room is like this as well they're kind of mirror images of one another in that they are childhood bedrooms these are the rooms they grew up in right and like 
they're not completely littered with like toys and signs of childhood, but some of them are still there, as would be true, I think, of anyone in their last year of high school in the bedroom they grew up in. And like for him, it's his trains. He's got some other stuff on his walls and on his desk. He's got this like little toy robot on his like um, dresser behind him. You know, she's got all sorts of crazy things in her room, which she shares with Anko. And then, of course, the thing that the, the like, you know, literal cord, umbilical cord between the two rooms is the little toy phone like you would have in a tree house that they have between one another which is this motif from you know episode one of the series all the way through to the very very end of the movie um and i think that that's something that's never you know brought into dialogue or into explicit text but just the idea that these characters are being pulled between childhood and adulthood in the spaces they are in is a really powerful idea here yeah and and that the thing that ties them together is this incredibly childish thing of the paper cups um, yes. and all of that. You also have the this motif of something that like that the show picks or the movie picks up from the show that I had never really sort of like zeroed in on in the show until the movie, which is that Tomiko never catches the cup and that she's yeah. terrible at ta- terrible at catching things, um, which is like one of those little tiny details that the show never really did anything with. I love that it continues to develop that here. Um, and you get all the stuff of the competition that the Baton Club is planning for that Kana has kind of like roped them all into. And you do have this one really great moment at the gym where Tomiko throws her baton up. She's completely distracted because this whole sequence of the movie's her her like sleepwalking through her life, not knowing how to deal with this revelation from Mochizo. Kana like sees the thing spinning and she like just starts mumbling to herself. And you, you realize that she's like calculating in her head, like, ah, oh, like where do I have to go? And she slides and catches it. Um, and you know, it's just a reminder that, Hey, Kana is in this movie also. And she fucking rules. <laughs> she rules. And I really want to praise that side of the movie because, you know, I, I don't know how I I want to word this like in relation to the show, but one thing about the show, because of the number of characters it's bouncing between in 12 episodes, the number of places it goes to is that like, I think that side of the show, her club never feels kind of as fleshed out uh, a like kind of entity or a friend group or a chemistry or whatever you want to say as kind of, you know, all the other clubs we've seen in KyoAni things. And that's not necessarily a criticism because it's not trying to be. If it if it were, they were doing it every episode and it didn't feel like it was coming together, that would be a different thing. But like in this movie, I feel like they get this chemistry that reminds me much more fulsomely of like the girls in Kaon or the mm-hmm. group in Hyoka or any of the other clubs we've seen where they really feel like not just, you know, individual characters who are very vivid, but an actual entity that in its totality is very vivid and has a lot of chemistry. And I really love that about the film. Yeah, it's it's great. And yeah, just like seeing all like the little things that Kana and Midori do to try to kind of help Tomiko along the way in their weird antics is incredibly fun. Um, so you get you know a bunch of moments here of at the school, Tomiko not knowing how to deal with the Mochizo stuff. And then you get this scene that I love so much, which is Tomiko gets up in the morning, she goes down, uh, Mommy Dai tells her, like, hey, take the day off. Like you're yeah. like something's going on, you don't need to deal with it. Um, and so she steps outside and it's like just before dawn. And all the other stores are closed and then they start opening up one by one and like the lights will come on the person. So it like starts with Kaudu comes out from the flower shop um, and you just get these little moments of her seeing all the people coming out. Um, the, the old grandpa dude who runs the bathhouse, who's also kind of like the head of the shopping district, is jogging and jogs past her. Everyone's like, hey, Tomiko, hey, good morning. Like, hey, you're up early. And you just get these little moments with all of the these people. And it's this kind of like reminder that life goes on. And as someone who has to get up just at an unholy fucking time, <laughs> just an inappropriately early 530 in the morning, that's just like absolute fucking hell. There is something about the like, you know, I've driven to work, I've gotten in 15 minutes before the students are going to get here, um, and I'm walking down the hallway to my room and passing by all the other teachers, and it's like, you know, dawn is like, the sun is just starting to come up, and you can see it coming through the windows, and you're saying good morning, like, how are you doing to everybody, that there is something about that, that like, it, it hit really hard with the way it's framed in this movie, especially because Tomiko normally doesn't do this she normally doesn't get up this early and then go out and right she's a she's a child so she doesn't run the store in that way yet 
Um, and so her kind of stepping out into this world of here's all the adults opening up their stores in the morning, like getting ready. And here's like the life that they lead and the sense of like life moves on. And this is like how things go. It's such a great expression of that time in the morning, that like particular thing. And the contrast of like the really soft um, blue light of, you know, pre-dawn with the really harsh electric lights of all the stores turning on and the contrast and how that kind of hits you in the face. It's just perfect the way that they express it visually on screen. It absolutely is. And, and this is the kind of moment that was kind of my favorite kind of thing we would get in the show is just when you bathe in the atmosphere of the shopping district. And this movie is just kind of a wash in scenes like that. This is definitely a standout, though. It's it's gorgeous. Yeah, absolutely gorgeous. Um, you get your big scene with uh, Tomiko and Midori at the school, um, where Midori sort of like helps her start to process um, everything that's going on here. You get a really a moment that if you're a big Midori fan, Midori fan, like hits you super hard where Tamako talks about um, how her and Mochizo have always been together. You get these flashes of these different moments from their childhood. And then she says like something like, you know, through like the good times and the bad or something like that. And you get a flash of her at the mom's funeral. Mochizo is there. Then you get a shot of Midori um, a close up on her now, like in, in the gym and her flashing back to that moment. And she was there too. And that's like, it's so brutal because Tamako doesn't think about the fact that Mochizo is not the only person who's been with her in those contexts. And like Mirodi thinking like, well, I was there too, but she was never noticed in quite that same way. Um, yeah. And it's like, what a quiet, but incredibly effective little moment that is. Absolutely. I, you know, there's a, there's a lot of melancholy shot through the Midori half of this movie that I'm really glad gets its own resolution kind of at the end, parallel to what's going on with yeah. um, our main characters. It's lovely. Yeah, but it's like, uh, no, Midori, she's, she's such a good girl. She doesn't she is. Know, doesn't deserve that. Um, yeah, so lots of, lots of, I just like scrolling through my screenshot gallery. There's so many fucking incredible shots, like the shot of Tamika walking up the stairs at night with the this jet stream across the sky. Yes. Uh, Tamika, Mark and Tamika love story definitely has put into context for me just how much KyoAni likes drawing planes and jet yep. streams. Like it is such a common visual motif across basically every single show we've watched because it just adds this nice little level of additional detail. Um... I love there's the scene at the cafe. I think this might even be where you have the quote yes, from with this episode, Sean. Because it's where um, uh, 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 Mochizo goes there and orders a coffee, but then is putting some sugar in it. And then you get this quote, um, no two days are ever the same. That's what makes them wonderful. But that's also what makes them sad. It's sadness that it gives each day its depth of flavor, just like coffee. That is the best of all of the... Yeah the weird record store cafe owners bits of advice. Yeah. It's, it's, I love that line so much. Yes. And that's where he's about to put sugar in. He's like, you know what? No, I'm today. I'm going to take it black. Um, yeah. cause that's what gives it its depth of flavor. And you get some incredible shots of him then sitting outside at night by the stepping stones where he confessed to her. Um, and it's just, it is moody as hell. Like the mood yes. in this movie is thick. Um, the vibes are immaculate. It's wonderful. Um, the next kind of big movement of the movie that I think transitions us into the final act is the sequence that happens when the grandfather um, apparently like chokes on some mochi or something. Yes. We don't really know, but he he went, went too hard on the mochi, and he is going to the hospital, and Mochi Zo just kind of kicks into action as a good friend and is there for them in the ambulance and all this. But you also see that, like, the the real like moment there is when um, Tamako kind of is is almost like pleading him to come along like not that he's not going to but the way she's just like I need you in this moment which of course is a big realization for what comes later is just that that is the person she wants with her in the ambulance in this very scary moment yeah because it because it does also like pick up from a thread that's in the show of where he always is her like source of emotional support in big and small ways in the show. And he's like the person that, you know, in like the beach episode when she's learning how to swim, he's the person that she goes to after she figures it out for that, like congratulation and that like reaffirmment. And I think that there's like this nice kind of like clarity of that relationship there that, and that ultimately he is the person that she goes for, for that kind of emotional 
like reinforcement basically um and to kind of like back her up and help her in those ways or to like praise her when she feels like that's what she deserves um you know where it's like very clear that she does have those kinds of feelings for Mochi's though she just has never put it into that context because she's taken yes. that relationship for granted so much um you do get this great moment at the um hospital where uh Bami Dai shows up I love his reaction is like Oh, what the hell? What you do? It's like, oh, you're not dead? Like, what's even happening here? Um, it's yeah. like, God, dead? Like, don't scare me like that. Um, and then he comes out. He sits on the bench next to Mochizo, has this, like, you know, classic dad and girl, daughter's boyfriend kind of heart to heart where he's, like, very gruff about it. Um, but he talks about that he's good, that Mochizo is going to go to Tokyo. Um, and he backs up mochizo's decision because there is this little subplot in the back of the movie that mochizo's dad has not accepted it and he's throwing yes. a huge fit about it there's an incredible moment where the mochizo's dad is talking about how he's <laughs> creating a new mochi which is like a severing of bond mochis that you give this mochi to someone that you never <laughs> want to interact with again and mom's like why would you make this who would ever buy this and he says well i'm thinking about giving it to our son which yeah. is like the harshest fucking bird i have ever heard in my life uh, but anyways, Mame Dai is kind of backing up uh, uh, Mochizo, and he says, like, that's good. Like, you're a man. You can make your own decisions. And then there's a long, intense pause. And then Mame Dai says, but make sure you come back home. Um, yeah. And it's just a man that hits you right in, in, the, in the heart. And then you get this moment there where Mochizo and Tamako are left behind. And this is another case of this, like, phenomenal blocking thing where it's kind of replicating some of the shots from the stepping stone scene when they were sitting on the steps um where you get these paired shots of them on the edge of the frame but they're next to each other um they're on like the same edge like mojizo is on the right hand edge tomiko is on the left hand edge because that's the moment where tomiko is starting to try to reach out to him and respond um but then that gets broken when mojizo says hey just forget about it like that thing i said like i know it's made things awkward like Let's just move on and go back to the way that things were. And then it does a it does a reverse shot that has then broken that distance they created or that um closeness that they created. And then it has flipped and on the opposite side, now they're on the far edges. Um, which yes. is just another like a great piece of simple blocking that communicates that oh, they were about to they're about to get it. Uh, like Tomiko is about to breach that, and then Mochizo fucks it up. Um, and it's just such a great little moment as your kind of end of second act turn where Tomiko has now accepted it and now she needs to figure out a way to bridge that gap um, to Mochizo. And again, this is like, this is what we mean when we say good storyboarding is that, yes. you know, you're laying out all these shots on the page and it's Yamana Naoko going, okay, here we're going to have them in separate shots, but the geometry makes it, they're close together, but in slightly separate worlds. But now it's a mirror of those shots but there are separate worlds where they are further off from one another. And it's just, it's, it's basic, but it's basic for a reason. And there's plenty of stuff that doesn't get those, those connections. And it is, it's just such good stuff. Yeah, it's, it's phenomenal. So then Tomiko goes home or goes to the school the next day. You have this good scene um, of her now talking to all of her friends about it, not just Midori. And that's where Shiori, who is like, you know, she doesn't play a huge role in this movie, but she's kind of the MVP, where Shiori just sort of like summarizes the whole relationship. And she's like, oh, that's amazing. Like, so Oji like confessed his love to you. Um, and then you didn't know what to do about that. And you're trying to avoid him for forever. But then he, um, you weren't, you know, kind of awkward. And this whole thing with your granddad happened. And then he uh, said that, hey, you should just kind of forget about it. But then that made you really sad. So I guess that means you love him, huh? And it's like yeah. that, she kind of like does that in this very kind of matter of fact way. And you get this great moment where it just sort of cuts to Tomiko. And she's got this kind of blank look on her face where it, like you kind of see like it has now it's now really sinking in. And then you get another just sort of like very meaningful cut to Midori, um, who is a little bit off to the side um, where it's like, you know, Shiori has dropped that bombshell that, oh, you love Mochizo. And this is then what ultimately prompts the full flashback where she remembers that Mochizo is the guy who helped her after her mom died by pretending to be the talking Mochi, not her dad, like she had thought for a very long time. Um, and it yeah. completely blows up her whole world. Blows up her whole world, but also gives her kind of a newfound 
confidence after a few failed attempts of like, okay, I'm going to make the decision to, to figure this out and do it, which is kind of, I feel like the third, if you, this is not a three act movie in like the Hollywood sense of the structure, but there is, I think, kind of a clear three parts to it of the build up to Mochizo's confession, the kind of liminal space after that, where neither is kind of sure what's happening. And then finally Tomiko kind of taking action, building to the end of the movie. Yeah. Um, so you get a bunch of antics at the school. This is where you get kind of doing all the stuff where it's like, hey, like if I uh, was confessing, I'd tell him to build me a house. She grabs yes. uh, she grabs Tomiko's phone and types on her phone like a thousand heart emojis. And it says, build me a house in the middle in Japanese. Yes. Uh, she's going to say that the mochi's out <laughs> before Tomiko stops her, which is great. Um, uh, this is also then where you get a lovely scene between Tomiko and Anko where um, Anko tries on the middle school uniform, Tamika's old middle school uniform, um, and you get this little moment of them bonding, and then they're listening to the tape of the dad, and then that rolls over. They had never listened to, to the end, because then the mom is recorded on it, and she sings a very... It's uh, Hikasa Yoko, by the way. It's Mio from Kaon plays the mom. Um, and it is... She does a very out-of-tune, twinkle, twinkle, little star. Um and sort of has re- it's her like returning that favor returning that message and this is where Tomiko kind of realizes that everything she is going through it is the exact same thing that her dad and her mom went through is of course like the thing in some ways that everybody goes through to some extent um yeah you know in different kinds of ways but it's where she kind of makes that connection that it's it's part of like this larger cycle of life that she is in yeah, I love the way they use the song that we, you know, we got in episode nine, and that is just this recurring motif, and it's so important. I, I love how that is worked into this movie. Um, you also get basically the, it's not a cultural festival where they're playing, it's like a marching competition or something that Midori really wanted to, no, not Midori, uh, Kana really wanted to do, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, just if you want, we really, never really got a full on, like, you know, baton twirling set piece in the TV show. Uh, and so I was wondering in the movie, like, are they going to use some of the movie budget to give us? And yeah, basically it's not, it is like an intercut montage with like, um, uh, uh, Mochizo back home kind of thinking about things and contemplating. So we don't see like every bit of the performance, like we do like the end of the dance and lucky star or something. Uh, but it is indeed spectacular animation of all these girls twirling their batons. Not an easy thing to animate. They do it very well. Yeah, it's, it's phenomenal. Uh, you also in there have one of my favorite shots in the movie where it's intercutting with Mochizo, who is back at home because he has to watch the shop. And there's this has been in that set the entire time where there's this poster in the background of his family's shop. That's this weird kind of Picasso-esque kind of abstract cubist image of a person with their arms outstretched in a big heart. And it says love. Um, and then, you, but you have this great shot where you have that in the background and then, uh, Mochizo is in the foreground in the exact same pose with his hand on the counter. And I love it. It's such a good little, um, shot there. And you have all the stuff with the gorgeous dance. Uh, Mochizo then tries to erase the uh, photos and videos of Tamako he has on his hard drive. Um, which are all just labeled Tomiko 1, Tomiko 2, Tomiko 3 in his Tomiko <laughs> folder, which is a little bit creepy, you know? Like, I, you know, I get it. And he was part of the video club. So they're, like, legitimately taking... It's not, like, spying on her or anything. But it's, you know, you maybe would have wanted, like, you know... Uh, you, the, name the file, like, miscellaneous folder or something like that. Like, at least try to disguise it, buddy. Anyone who opens up that fucking Mac and looks at your desktop, uh, it's, you know... Uh, they know who he's got it for. Yeah, yeah I mean, there's, there's an incredibly funny line in the intro of this movie where, where he, when he's doing the recap, he says, "You know, I don't think anybody's noticed, but I kind of, but I'm kind of in love with my next door neighbor, yes. Tomiko." I'm like, dude, everybody and their fucking mother has noticed. Um, it's it is not a secret. You have a folder called the Tomiko folder on your desktop. Like you're not no. hiding it. <laughs> It, it is not as pervy as what Kion does um, in yeah, uh, in Mikudu. Haruhi with yeah with Mikudu. Um One other thing about this scene, you got a screenshot of this: the fake Finder icon for their <laughs> fake Mac. It's so good. I want someone to do an update. Apple, please make an update for Mac that lets me use that Finder icon because it's got like these. It's the same like white or like white and blue like halves, but the like eyes are like these very narrow slits, and then the mouth is very thin and like 
zen and it kind of looks like the finder icon if it just smoked a really good blunt that's like how i would describe it it is like it is high and it is love and life and i want that finder icon so bad (laughs) yeah that's exactly why i took the screenshot because i had the exact same thought that yes it looks like if your mac fucking hot boxed um that is what the the icon would look like uh it's 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 incredible um love it it, Okay, so then this leads us into the kind of like the whole big climax of the movie where Tomiko, um, where the school shuts down because apparently there's like some horrific flu epidemic. This is like a tiny thing that's happening in the background of the movie. It's a very funny justification for why nobody else is going to be at the school. Um, But, you know, apparently they couldn't have school that day. So they've done this thing where everyone calls one person. And so she's the person who's supposed to call Mochi. So she decides not to so that they'll be alone at school. Um, Midori shows up. You have this just gorgeous scene in the classroom between Tamako and Midori where Midori um, plays her last um, sort of like trick, her strategy um, her or her tactics, because uh, Kana later calls her a tactician um, after yes. this. But where she lies to her to kind of get her to go run to where Mochizo is, who's going to go visit the campus. But Tamako thinks that he's going to actually move. Um, and you get your kind of classic KyoAni um, like running style kind of um, finale here where they've gotten very good at someone desperately having to run to get to the culture festival or wherever. This is also like the most classic rom-com finale ever of someone yes. at like the train station or the airport or something. And you have to run there to get there on time. But part of what thing- makes it work so well, I think is because yeah. Midori, it's not a organic version of that. It is Midori has like put the idea in Tamako's yes. mind. You're in a rom-com now, go. Uh, and so that's like kind of what creates this pressure situation that doesn't actually exist. He's coming back the same day, right? Yes. Yeah. It, yeah. yeah. If if she missed this, it would be completely fine. Uh, but one other thing that makes this sequence so good is that it's intercut with this last se- sequence between Midori and Kanna, who also shows up to the classroom because she wanted to build a new shelf to put in the back of the class, which is amazing. And you know that she's serious because she brought a hammer and fucking nails with her, yes. which is so good. I just, God, I love Kana so much. She just shows up with a hammer and nails at a classroom on the day where school's not in um, is not a thing. You know, uh, if they looked at the security cameras, the, the staff would probably be very shocked. It's like, what the hell is this girl doing? Um, but no, I get- love this scene and I love them like running through the kind of field around the school and just it's very freeing it's Midori is finally smiling it feels like this is when she kind of lets go of her love for Tamako but I also think like is there a little her and Kana are we meant to take a little bit of like maybe there's a future for the two of them yeah like because I wasn't I wasn't feeling that when I watched it the first time but when I was skimming back through to take some of my screenshots and I got to this and watched the scene again I started to get more of that vibe like I don't know if that how intentional that is but yeah there's at the very least the bare minimum there like it is she has kind of like found the beauty of like the friendships she has and that like that can support her she does doesn't need to be this sort of like bitter longing um romantic thing attachment she has to Tomiko is either that or maybe she's realized, hey, I've had the hottest carpenter around <laughs> who tells, can tell a mean joke and build a sick house. Um, you know, if yeah. you need someone to build a bookshelf for you, like, here you go. Here's Kana. She's a girl who can, you know, measure an angle just by sight, um, you know, catch a baton by calculating the trajectory in her head. Um, it's Kana um, all day, every day. Like, if I had to pick one of these girls, like, it's Kana's, like, the best one. Um, yeah. And I, I can, and, you know, I think part of it is just I can I can buy Kana as also being gay, if that is, like, yes. what we're going for with this relationship. Um, there's there's plenty of ways that that, I feel like, makes sense for the character. And I don't know. I just, I, and I, I don't think the scene is, like, trying to be super explicit about it. it. It's more, and I think part of it is because that scene is about Midori kind of letting go of this one phase of her life and embracing the present means there are more possibilities for her. And if one of those possibilities is Kana or any other girl she might fall for, then that's good. That's her moving on too, right? Yeah, because there is this like little thing where Kana does, um, she does this like kind of camera thing and with her eye yes. where she like makes the frame and she tells, says me like, you're making a really good face right now. Um, and that she kind of has the shocked look. And I think that was the thing when watching it back, like, I was like, that kind of has like a little bit of that energy to it. Um, yeah. I don't know how intentional that is or like how hard they're leaning that direction, but definitely like it's got a little bit of that vibe. 
Um, also have to shout out with Kana that she's, when they're running outside, she's doing the Naruto run, which is yes, perfect. Yes, I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect. It, it's amazing. It's just, again, I love her to death. Uh, but, like, the reason they're running out there is because Kana has a fear of heights, and so they're, she uh, immediately helps push her up onto this tree. And you have one of my favorite shots in the movie of the camera down at the ground looking up at Midori and then Kana up in the tree. Um, and I kind of like that they don't um, they don't actually show you the view. Like you see Kana, she gets on top of the branch and her face kind of lights up and then you get this shot looking at the both of them from below. Um, but you don't get a big money shot of like, what is it that Kana's looking at? And I kind of like that they have like this restraint to say like, that's kind of for them because we're pulling our focus back onto Tamako for the conclusion. But it is just like a beautiful way to wrap up that kind of like subplot and those character arcs for this movie. It makes the characters feel very full and rich in a way that I don't know if I came out of the show feeling that they were, but here like absolutely, 100%. Yes. Um, And then the final scene on the platform at the train station just bringing all of our motifs of space and distance between these two people into the limelight and making that kind of the the language through which this final scene happens of them being a little apart still and then closing that gap through their silly little paper phone she's brought and and cut to black and it's perfect yes, it's perfect i love that the paper cups are like a little bit crumpled which happened earlier in the movies and they kind of you know that visual metaphor of they've kind of been banged up they've been through a lot yeah but like they're still here that connection is still strong um yeah that you kind of talked through it earlier but that the way the whole ending is set up is just incredible of her finally catching the paper cup the first time she's ever done that bring it to her mouth it cuts to black she says mojizo i love you um and then it and then it hangs on that for a while on black where you you're not even sure is it going to go to credits now like it hangs on black for a while the guitar piece comes in from their cover of the love song but then it does come back mojizo has a great reaction shot tamago has a reaction shot then you see this wide shot of both of them together and i love the last thing is mojizo puts his head in his hands like he did with the birthday cake and that stuff yes um which again it's such a good piece of characterization um, that, you know, they don't try to, like, make him, like, hyper-masculine, stoa, stoic, whatever. It's not like a single tear drops down his cheek or anything like that. Like, no, it's full-on head in hands. Like, he can't show his face. It's great. And then for the third time, Tomica Love Story, this was the movie, in case you forgot. Um, <laughs> and, then, and then you get your big k style um, cool ending animation yes. with the love song that's all like stop motion but obviously it's like not literally stop motion but it is animated like it is stop motion and it's fucking amazing and you know it's like after you made this like 80 minute movie that's just one of the most gorgeous animated movies you've ever seen it's like do you really need to show off even more by making your <laughs> whole ending animation that elaborate and complicated um, apparently but it's great yeah, and then there's also a second song called Principle yes. that is uh, fantastic as well. Um, I like all the songs that Aya Suzuki uh, sings for these, but yeah. Yes. Um, and in fact, we should probably break those down before we end. But it, yeah, I, this this movie, Sean, uh-huh. it's incredible. Yamada Naoko, two for two on feature films. Holy crap. Yeah, <laughs> she's, like... She's not even 30 yet, right? At, at the time she's directing this? I mean, fucking no, crazy. Yeah. Just, yeah. God, what a... Because I think probably this is an I think this is an even better movie than Kaon the movie. I, I think I think Kaon in its totality maybe feels like the bigger achievement to me than Tomiko Market, but like this movie is the best individual thing from either that she's done yet. I think as a director, I I agree, and it definitely like you know if you didn't already have like very high expectations just based on reputation for Silent Voice and. Um, <laughs> You know, in that, what is it, Liz in the Blue Bird movie. It's yes. like, Yamada Naoko is a hell of a fucking movie director. I mean, she's a great TV director yeah. also, obviously. But holy shit, this movie is so good. Like, I was legitimately blown away. Yeah, I think, Sean, I think, you know, maybe in 10, 20 years, we could very well see Yamada Naoko in this next phase of her career being sort of of the stature of a Makoto Shinkai or Mamoru Hosoda, just kind of your next original feature anime auteur i'm very curious how much she continues working on television her next project is a movie um but she's 
she's of that. I mean, I think she's a better director than Shinkai, um, you know, and I think she could absolutely be that kind of like global hit maker in terms of big original stories on screen. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just it's incredible. Um, so I'm obviously extremely, extremely excited to continue uh and eventually you know we've got a couple of other things to finish off this part but when you get back to yamada naoko i think there's very exciting stuff in the future absolutely all right so tamako love story you know i i was not as hot on tamako market as you were but i liked it and overall it led to one of my favorite <laughs> things kyoto animation has ever made in tamako love story so i think tamako market absolutely worth it uh and the movie fucking oh my god and i know in its totality it's one of your favorite things ever so that's great yes yeah i i i adore this whole thing i love uh i definitely recognize the tomica market is uh weird and i definitely get why not everybody <laughs> loves it the same way i do but i just i totally just 100 vibe with the show and then the movie is like a crowning achievement on top of that um we do have a couple of the the songs that we didn't talk about yet so we've got our um opening theme from Tomica Market, which is Dramatic Market Ride, um, uh, composed by and uh, written by Kadoka Tomiko, um, who also did the music for the show, but sung by Suzaki Aya, the voice actress for Tomiko. I love this song, um, but even more so, I love the animation that goes with it. That yes. that like whole thing of her going through and kind of marching through the the whole shopping district with her baton and meeting all the characters. There's just all these great details of animation, like this way she like kind of hypes up um, Anko when she runs over to Anko and stuff. Um, it's just a, such a delightful piece of animation to go with this very positive, fun hip song. Yeah, no, it's great. It weirdly like <laughs> when I, so I saw this animation out of context when I was creating the new opening for our show. Cause several of the shots are in there cause it's such a good opening. There's so much good animation to use, but I think that was around the time the like Willy Wonka movie was out and the new one with Timothy Chalamet and there were all the clips online and I'm like oh the Tomica Market is like the good version of whatever the fuck that is trying to do <laughs> where it's also like this magician boy comes to town and is doing things I'm like this this is this is better uh, so I don't know why that association is in my head I think it's just when I was working on that but it is a great opening animation and I enjoy the song but the closing song Neguse one of my favorite yes. closing songs we've had in the Kyoto animation season it's such a good song yeah, it's it's phenomenal. Uh, it's, that one is uh, composed by Yamaguchi Sugudu, who he's done a bunch of like the character songs and stuff like that for things that we have watched. Um, also voiced by uh, or sung by Suzaki Aya, and yeah, it's it's great. The vibes of it are so immaculate, especially just like kind of coming into it with that shot of the record player, and you get like yes. the ma wa du ma wa du de kodo. Kodo. Yeah, it's yeah, it's great. Um, yeah, it is definitely a a phenomenal pair. But I think I probably with you, I think I probably like the ending even more than the opening theme. Yeah, and then the the songs. We already talked about Koi no Uta a bunch. It rocks. Yes. That was also written by Yamaguchi Suguru. I didn't know Yamada Naoko did the lyrics. That makes sense because um, mm -hmm. they are very, very tied into the story. But yes, yeah, um, that's yeah, great. That definitely, Koi no Uta is definitely like that's that's the most K-O'd thing of this whole thing is they because it feels like a song that. Um, if you had like the boy version of Kaon, that's the songs yes. that they would have written, you know, like that's kind of almost like what mommy Dai he, he was the Kaon boy when he was in high school or something. Absolutely. And it, yeah, it, it feels like a companion piece to that show in that way. And then there's the final end theme principle also sung by Tamako or by Suzaki Aya, uh, that is very nice as well. Yes. Um, so music very, very good across the board. Yeah. So, hey, I'm really glad we did this episode, Sean. Even if I had truly disliked the show, which I didn't, it just wasn't as much my cup of tea as some other things we've watched, which, to be fair, we've watched a lot of really good stuff. Something huh. has to be your least favorite <laughs> at some point. And I, yeah. uh, you know what, the more we've talked about it, I would put this at least above Kanon and maybe a couple other oh, things. It is very it's, good. Um, it's easily above Kanon. Okay. Like, it's, it's better. Yeah, okay. I mean, okay. yeah, I don't even think uh, yeah. they're particularly close. Especially with the movie thrown in there, absolutely. Uh, yes. But man, that movie movie uh it could have been 12 episodes of torture and then getting that movie would make it all worth it it was not 12 episodes of torture it was 12 episodes that were frequently very good and some that i didn't like as much um but you loved them all and i'm happy for you yes very much so um and you do have uh the thing the one thing i wanted to say because there was that the uh i forgot to mention it but at the very end episode 12 uh, you have a couple of really good lines i just want to i just want to echo here as we started then transition to talk about what we're going to watch next week 
Um, but you have um, the, the record store guy says in episode 12, life is more than just saying goodbyes. It's the encounters that make up human life. But that saying that line in English doesn't quite sell it because when I say it's the counters that make up human life, he says in English the words human life in the middle of that Japanese sentence. Yes. And that's the uh, that's the that's the chef's kiss. That's the extra piece. But then you have this last line. This is the last line in the show. And I love this to death. I retranslated a little bit because I thought their translation was a little plain um, because this is the thing that Deta leaves with you at the end of the show, which I just think is a beautiful sentence here where he says the year may change but there are other things which never will they cannot be seen if you look in the dark but they can be seen if you look with your heart and that's the that's that's what Tom of Mark it's all about baby um absolutely so what so will we be looking at with our heart next week, Sean? Yes, so that's Tom Can Market. So next week, we're watching a show and a movie. Um, again, um, something that I'm very curious to watch because I have seen the show forever ago, not the movie. And I remember this show being weird and very different. So I'm excited to kind of revisit it <laughs> um, and see uh, what my take on, is on it now. And, and I'm very curious to see the movie because I never saw it originally. So we are watching next time Beyond the Boundary. We are watching the TV show with the OVA. So that's 12 episodes in an OVA. And we are watching the finale movie. So there is a recap movie. We're not covering that since we're just watching the whole show. Um, but we are going to cover that finale movie, like what we did today with Tomica Market and Tomica Love Story. Uh, you know, it's something to look forward with that is that this is going to be the first series directed by Ishidate Taichi, um, whom we have seen do a lot of different episodes, but he has not done a show yet. And then, of course, he will eventually also go on to do Violet Evergarden. So that's something very much to look forward to next time on Japanimation Station's Kyoto Vacation. Oh,